Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Welcome to Double Portion Inheritance Ministries. I'm Maria Marola Wold. And I'm Gary Wold. In accordance with 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 14, after the Sabbath is over, we ask you to prayerfully consider a one-time or recurring donation to www.paypal.com forward slash paypal me forward slash DPI ministries or www.venmo.com at Maria-Marola. You can also use the email address double portion inheritance at gmail.com. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining. Today is March 16th, 2024, and the name of this study is When is Passover? Now, I'm going to be talking about this year's Passover, 2024, and apparently there is some controversy in the camp with regard to the Abib and the barley, and this happens every year, and so um, I decided to do a short teaching on this before going into the next teaching. So this should only take no more than 30 minutes, hopefully no more than that, maybe at the most 40 minutes. And then we're going into the next teaching after that, which is going to be called up until the 14th day and between the two evenings. So uh, the name of this is when is Passover 2024? Now, for the sake of YouTube, I just called it when is Passover because I want to be able to refer to this teaching in next year's every year, which means to watch narrowly for to be a watchman. The Hebrew word for month is Kodesh, which literally means a renewed lunar cycle or new moon. In other words, we are commanded to watch for the new moon. Now, I suppose you could also include when it says to observe the month of Bib. The word Abib in Hebrew means green ears of corn. That is literally what that word means. Now, it's not talking about maize corn. It's talking about barley corn. But the to watch narrowly for, we're not only watching for the new moon. We are also watching for the Abib, the barley. So, so when he says to observe, to watch narrowly for, we could also say it's not just watching for the new moon, but the barley that goes along with that new moon. Okay, so since 1948, when Israel was officially reborn as a nation, there has been no excuse to continue using a prefixed calendar. But the Jewish Sanhedrin has not made a ruling on this matter yet, as they are still waiting for the temple to be built first. Therefore, the rest of the Jewish world goes along with the Hallel 2 calendar. And I have another uh, blog here called What Constitutes a Biblical New Moon? And so I recommend going to that blog later. Uh, so there are those within the Hebraic community who have eliminated now the sighting of the moon for the timekeeping mechanism that Yahuwah has established. Those who are following the non-canonical book of Jubilees have gone with the same solar calendar that the Roman Catholic Church uses. But what does our creator say? How does he want us to measure times and seasons? Well, it starts right here in Bereshit, Genesis 1.14, It says, and Elohim said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons. Now, this word seasons is moed. Moedim is the plural word. Moedim, festivals, feasts. Okay. So, Yahuwah has given us the sun, the moon, and the stars as a time clock to measure the seasons, okay? And as I said, the Hebrew word for seasons, you know, the the singular is moed, the plural is moedim, which means festivals or or feast days. Genesis 1.16 says, And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light 
to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now, this is obvious. The greater light is the sun to rule the day, the daylight period. The lesser light to rule the night is obviously the moon. And then he says, and he made the stars also. Now, those who have now abandoned the Torah for timekeeping are now consulting the book of Jubilees, which eliminates the commandment to cite the new moon. Okay, now, I just need to insert this here. Even though the book of Jubilees is not canonical, it's not been canonized, um, I believe it's possible to maybe glean something out of it, maybe something historical, but we cannot consult the book of Jubilees as though it is scripture. It is not scripture, and it does not trump the first five books of Moses. OK, if you're using the book of Jubilees to trump the first five books of Moses, you're out of order. OK, the Torah, the first five books always comes first when rightly dividing the word of the creator. We always consult the Torah first, secondly, the prophets and the writings. See, our Messiah even told us this. In um, Luke 24, 44, he says, all things written about me in the Torah and in the Nabim prophets and in the writings, that would be Psalms, all things written about me in the Torah and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. So we look to those three bodies of uh, scripture. He never said to consult these other books. He never said this. In fact, the book of Jubilees wasn't even penned until the second century BC. Why would we look to a book that was penned 200 years before Messiah when the Torah was penned 2000 years prior to that? Okay. At least. Okay. So that is really uh, not a biblical way to do things. And I've got this other blog called why a 364 day calendar is not biblical. In brief, I will say this, no place in scripture do we find a precedent for a 364 day calendar. Now it's convenient. I'll give you that. It is definitely convenient because if we divide a year to 364 days, it you know, you can divide that evenly by the, the number seven. So that means every year is exactly 52 weeks. So that makes things convenient. And I understand on its face, it looks neat and tidy and everything's even. However, we know from the entire council of scripture that Yahuwah views a calendar year as 360 days not 364 days, right? In fact, geometry tells us that there are 360 uh, degrees in a circle, right? So the, you know, the only reason why we are now, it takes 365 days to, for the earth to make a revolution around the sun is because ever since the days of the flood, there have been uh, things that have caused the earth to be tilted in such a way that the earth spins at a wobble. Okay, so now, ever since the days of the flood, things are off kilter a little bit. And so now it takes 365 days rather than 360 days for the earth to make a revolution around the sun. However, I believe we are going back to the days of Noah very soon. As soon as the tribulation period begins, we are told that the tribulation is going to last for 1,260 days. That's the length of ministry of the two witnesses. And the beast shall speak blasphemies for 42 months. Now, 42 months is exactly, if we take 42 times 30, okay, 30 equal months, that comes out to 1,260 days, okay? So we are going back to the days of Noah. 
And what's going to cause the days to be shortened? I've got a blog here called Accept Those Days Should Be Shortened. And in this blog, I explain that, you know, Isaiah 24, 1 tells us the earth is going to be turned upside down. That's talking about the magnetic poles. Scientists have been seeing this phenomenon for years, and it's coming I believe it's just like when a baby is in the womb and it's a breech pregnancy. What happens? The baby is turned upside down in the womb. Okay. The baby positions himself to go through the birth canal. And our Messiah talked about that, you know, in the end of days, he says, these are the beginning of birth pains. So the earth is like a pregnant woman. And when the earth is turned upside down, when that magnetic pole shift takes place, I believe that's going to happen just at the same moment that we see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place in the temple. And the two witnesses are going to be that one new man. They are going to be the man child who is born of the woman, which is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the woman in revelation 12 and the, the man child are the corporate two witnesses, you know, the two houses of Israel and their companions the two overcoming assemblies, the two olive trees. Okay. The two witnesses are the two olive trees, the house of Yehuda and the house of Ephraim. Okay. And the two overcoming assemblies are Smyrna and Philadelphia. They are the companions, the Gentile companions who join them and come out of mystery Babylon paganism. And they join the two witnesses. There's going to be a corporate body of people, I believe, in Jerusalem and throughout the world, they're going to be preaching repentance, just like John the Baptist did leading up to our Messiah's coming. I believe there's going to be a corporate body of people that are going to be like the John the Baptist's in the earth. And when they start their ministry of 1,260 days, I believe that's going to be the very beginning of the tribulation. I believe there's going to be this cataclysmic event that's going to cause everything to change in one moment. It's like the abomination of desolation is going to be seen. Uh, there's going to be a magnetic pole shift that's going to cause, you know, earthquakes and tsunamis and natural disasters throughout the world. And everything's going to go into the great tribulation. And in, when that happens, we're going back to a 360 day year. Okay. And so this calendar that everybody's all, you know, getting on board with now, the 364 day calendar, um, that's, you know, cited in the book of Jubilees, that's going to become irrelevant. Okay. Totally irrelevant. So, this is it's this is not biblical. It sounds good. I'm, I'll give you that. It sounds good because it's even and it's convenient and you can cite things ahead of time instead of waiting for the creator to decide the times and the seasons. You can just do it yourself, right? Take matters into your own hands. That's what this calendar is all about. Taking matters into your own hands and trying to uh, force the calendar to fit your own agenda. Okay. But Yahuwah does not want us to do that. He wants us to be totally dependent upon him. And so people say, oh, but there's all this fighting and there's all this, you know, and I understand that, but Yahuwah wants us to struggle. Remember when Jacob wrestled with Yahuwah all night long? Look, that's part of being birthed through the birth canal, there's going to be a struggle. And if there's no struggle, then, then it's not, you know, it's not legit. We can just make things clean and easy and simple. And there's no, there's no wrestling. Okay. 
So, you know, I've encountered at least 10 different followers of Messiah over the past couple of years who were at one time keeping the sighted moon. And now these same people have abandoned biblical timekeeping in exchange for the Book of Jubilees, which is a pseudopigraphal work. Now, this word pseudopigraphal means that it's attributed to a different author than who it was really penned by. OK, so this means that the writings in the in this book pretend to have been written by the Zadok priesthood, but they were not. It is more likely that the book was written by the Essenes in the Qumran community in the second century B.C. So there's a growing trend these days among professing believers to embrace extra biblical writings and Gnosticism in exchange for the 66 inspired books that were canonized by the kingdom of Judah and by the Protestant churches in England. Okay. These same people are holding the Roman Catholic Apocrypha books. And the reason I call them Roman Catholic is because they're the only ones who've canonized the Apocrypha books. Once again, I want to I want to emphasize I'm okay with some of the apocrypha books like for instance the book of Maccabees. I'm totally okay with those books for historical purposes. But we do not hold the apocrypha books to be inspired scripture. They're not on the same level. In fact, some apocryphal books such as the book of Tobit for instance, actually endorses praying to the dead, uh, purgatory, praying to the saints. There's some unbiblical things in the Apocrypha books that contradict scripture. And so for that reason, they didn't make the canon. That's the reason why. Okay. Now, can we still consult those books for historical purposes? Absolutely. Like I said, the book of Maccabees is one, one example. And the book of Maccabees did used to be part of the 1611 King James Bible. But, you know, I've heard that, you know, I've read that King James ran out of uh, funds in his treasury. So he only so he left those books out, the Apocrypha books. And I have to wonder if, if Yahuwah's design wasn't part of that, because when I asked the father about the 66 books, you know, why are there 66 books? One of the things he showed me. And I should have put it in here in this blog, but I didn't. But um, there is, I'm looking for a photograph here for you guys. Um, he showed me the table of showbread, okay? Table of showbread. And you'll see that the table of showbread contains two stacks of 66 books, okay? Two stacks of six, two stacks of six loaves, I should say. Six and six, okay? Six and six for the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, the word of Yahuwah is likened unto bread, right? Like the bread from heaven. So doesn't it make sense that there's 66 books for the 12 tribes? Well, I believe that's why Yahuwah has given us 66 books, okay? And so I'm going to say that the 66 books is by Yahuwah's design and those books are inspired, including the, the renewed covenant, the Brit Hadashah and any other book after that, you know, in the book of revelation, our Messiah said, if any man adds to the words that are written in this book, Elohim will add to the, to him, the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man takes away from the words that are written in this book, Elohim will take away from him uh, his name out of the book of life. This is in Revelation chapter 22. He says this. Now, some people will say, oh, he was only talking about the book of Revelation. Well, he didn't specify that it was only talking about the book of Revelation. But I would say, I believe the canon was closed when our Messiah said those things. So anyone adding anything else after the canon was closed, I say we cannot accept anything beyond those 66 books as being canonical or scripture. And we should just stick with the 66 books. Like I said, it's fine to consult some of these books for 
historical reference. That's fine. Um, and I'm fine with, you know, citing certain things, but we must always put scripture above these extra writings. Okay. So the people that are putting the book of Jubilees ahead of the five books of Moses, they are saying that the word Kodesh, which is new moon, simply means month. Okay. So they're turning this into, oh, it just means month. It doesn't mean moon. Okay. Well, that's true. It doesn't, it's not talking about the actual object of the moon. Yereach is the word for the object of the moon. But what does it mean to watch narrowly for? What do you do? Look at a paper calendar hanging on the wall and you stand there and stare at the paper calendar. Is that what it means to watch narrowly for the month? I mean, that doesn't make any sense, right? You don't st stand there and look at a paper calendar on the wall you know, I mean, in those days, they didn't even have paper calendars. The only thing that makes sense to watch narrowly for is a slight sliver of the moon. Okay. So the people that have, are now switching to the Book of Jubilees instead of the Torah, they will argue, and I've heard people argue this. It's the craziest argument I've ever heard. But they will argue that Genesis 1.16 is not describing the moon when it says that Yahuwah has made the lesser light to rule the night. I even had a guy the other day try to tell me that when Yahuwah says that he made the lesser light to rule the night, that he was only talking about the stars. OK, but that doesn't even make sense, because when you go back to Rev to Genesis 1, 16, it says two great lights, the greater light to rule the d day and the lesser light to rule the night. We know that's so obvious that that's talking about the moon. And then it says he made the stars also. Well, the stars are more than one light. It's billions of lights. OK, tiny little lights. So the two great lights have to be the sun to rule the day. And the next greater light, the lesser light compared to the sun, would be the moon. Because he said he made two great lights. Well, the stars are billions of lights. So the stars are not included in, to, in these two great lights. Okay. Now, but here's more evidence. And I showed this guy the evidence. And it was just crickets. He didn't have anything to say. I said, let's test the theory, shall we? King David repeated... Genesis 114 through 16 and Psalms 136. And he identifies the lesser light as the moon. Look at what he says in Psalms 136, verse 6 through 9. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his, for his mercy endures forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night for his mercy endures forever. There you have it. King David clarified what Genesis 1 16 was telling us. So if anyone tries to tell you, oh, the lesser lights not talking about the moon, don't listen to them. They are out of their minds. They're not using common sense. Okay. After you who had delivered the children of Israel out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, he wanted us to commemorate the time when he delivered us out of the bondage of sin and death. From that point, moving forward, Yahuwah commanded Moshe and Aharon to begin the year in the first month called Abib, or in modern Hebrew, they say Aviv with a V, or Nisan. Nisan is a Babylonian name. They picked up while they were in Babylon, okay? Uh, Exodus 12, Shemot 12, 1 and 2. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe and Aharon in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, this, this was to fall every year 14 days before Yahuwah's Passover, Pesach in the month of Abib. In Nehemiah, Nehemiah 2, 1, and also in Esther 3, 7, it says this first month on the Hebrew calendar uh, began to be called Nisan. So, they, so this name is mentioned in scripture, 
But this was while the house of Judah were in Babylonian exile that you began using this name. Today, the rabbinic calendar still uses the Babylonian name of Nisan for the month of Abib. So the word Abib in the Strong's Hebrew Concordance, this is what it means. It's number 2424, Abib. It means meaning to be tender, green, a young ear of grain, hence the name of the month of Abib or Nisan. Okay, so every year in Israel, we determine a new year by three things, according to Genesis 1, 14 through 16, as I've already said, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Those are the first three witnesses. The barley, I believe, is the fourth witness, and I'll explain to you why I say that. So stay with me. We first determine a new year by the full rotation of the earth around the sun, which takes 365 days. This is called a circuit. The Hebrew word for circuit in scripture is tekufa. It's number 8622. It means a revolution of the earth around the sun. Okay. A circuit. Uh, that's really the, the word for equinox. Because some people will say, oh, well, the word equinox isn't in the Bible. That's true. That is comes from a Latin word. Equinox comes from the Latin. But the idea, the concept is there. It's called Tekufa. So King David speaks of the revolution of the earth around the sun each year. In Psalms 19.6, he says his going forth is from one end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And the u- word he uses is Tekufa. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Okay, now once we have determined that the earth has made a full revolution around the sun, we cite the solar year at the equinox that's coming in three days. March 19th this year is the equinox, the spring equinox. Secondly, we look for the new moon following the vernal equinox. Now, in previous years, it used to usually be between March 21st through 25th. In recent years, it's been getting, you know, coming earlier, March 19th or 20th. This is another sign that the days are being shortened. Remember, our Messiah said, except those days should be shortened. He said, no flesh will be saved. Okay, the days are being shortened. I believe we're going back to the days of Noah. Okay, we're going back to a, a year being 360 days. Okay, uh, after we watch for the um, for the sun, okay, to make a the earth to make a full revolution around the sun, we watch for the equinox. Then we also watch for the new moon following following the the solar year. And then finally, the third witness would be the the stars, okay? So the stars tell us we're in the correct month. Now, some people have said, but it doesn't say that in Scripture. Well, it does It does hint about that. It does tell us the stars, the sun, the moon, and the stars are for seasons, okay? So we know that when Abraham was offering up his son, Yitzhak, here we have an a, a artist's depiction of Abraham offering up his son on the altar. And Yahuwah provides the substitute offering. The substitute is the ram and his horn is caught in a thicket. Now, um, I wanted to use this as a um, an illustration. And I kind of, you know, forgot to do this to add this to the blog. But... Um, Let's find the the uh, the thorns, crown of thorns, right? So um, find the thorns, crown of thorns. So yeah, crown of thorns. Here we go. Okay. So you got the ram with his horns caught in a thicket. You see the prophetic picture there? How Messiah wore a crown of thorns on his head. Okay. 
That's what this ram symbolizes. This ram, and if you look up the word for thicket, okay, in the Strong's, it actually means a thorn, okay? The ram's horns were caught in these, you know, branches, but it, the word, it can also mean a, a thorn. So a thicket can mean a thorn. The ram became the substitute for Israel, the firstborn sons. Remember when he was bringing them out of Egypt? What did Yahuwah say to Pharaoh? He says, Israel is my firstborn son. He said this in Exodus 4.22. In the same way that uh, Abraham is offering up his firstborn son, and he didn't have to kill him. Because why? The substitute was provided. The substitute was the ram with his horn caught in a thicket. This is a prophetic picture of our Messiah who wore a crown of thorns, his head in a thicket. Okay. So it might not be explicitly, it doesn't say explicitly in scripture, oh, make sure the ram is in the sky, but there's some things that don't have to be spelled out that explicitly. It's so obvious, you know, and, and by that reasoning, where does the Bible say, go search for barley? It doesn't tell us to search for barley, does it? However, <laughs> nevertheless, even though scripture doesn't tell us to search for barley, we know that we have to because... Leviticus 23 says the priest has to wave the first sheaf of the barley. So how's the priest supposed to wave the first sheaf of the barley unless we go looking for barley? So that's kind of implied, even though the Bible doesn't come right out and say, now go searching for barley. It doesn't say that. We just know we have to do it. And it's the same thing with this. Okay. So the people that are saying, oh, where does the Bible say the ram has to appear in the sky? Well, where does the Bible say you have to go searching for barley? For that matter, if you're going to be that nitpicky, okay, look, we know that when it's the month of Passover, we're going to see the signs in the heavens. The signs in the heavens tell the story, okay? Our Messiah became the firstborn of every creature, Colossians 1.15, when he resurrected from the dead and he has given us the right to become firstborn sons when we are born again of incorruptible seed, 1 Peter 1.23, when the ram is seen over Israel and the first crescent moon appears, then we know it is the month of Abib when the barley is green. You can also download the Stellarium software. Uh, to look for the constellations over Israel, over Jerusalem, okay? And so this is the, you know, the link to the Stellarium software. Okay, so I want to give a disclaimer here. We are warned in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 11, not to use the constellations for fortune telling and divination purposes, the constellations are not there to tell you, oh, next month you're going to meet a boyfriend. Next month you're going to get a new job. You're going to get a raise or a promotion. That's not what they're for. Our Messiah, you know, our creator already told us what they're for, for times and for seasons. Okay. That not to tell you, oh, you're going to get lucky at the, at the slot machines next month. No. Forget that. That is what the heathens do. The heathens use the constellations for, for worldly stuff like that. Okay. Genesis 1, 14 through 16 tells us that Yahuwah gave us the sun, the moon, and the stars for timekeeping. Well, how are we supposed to use the stars for timekeeping? And so all these people asking me, well, where does it say that, that the ram has to be above Jerusalem during the month of Passover? Well, it tells us in scripture that he's given us the stars for timekeeping. So how do you use the stars for timekeeping? I mean, it doesn't spell it out for us, but it's understood. Okay. Finally, when the first ripening of the barley harvest is seen, we can know for sure that the new year has arrived. Now, we're not supposed to determine our times and seasons by a predetermined date. 
We are meant to be totally dependent upon Yahuwah to establish the times and the seasons. As soon as the barley is a beeb and the new moon appears following the vernal equinox, we can accurately say that it is Rosh Hashanah or the head of the year according to Yahuwah's rendering. Okay. Um, now in Shemot, Exodus 13, it says, um, 13, 3 and 4, and Moshe said unto the people, remember this day in which you came out from Mitzrayim or Egypt out of the house of bondage for by strength of hand, Yahuwah brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came you out in the month Abib. Now, some people have written to me questioning my use of the term vernal equinox because, you know, the witches and the pagans also refer to this time as the vernal equinox. But see, they use the calendar uh, for their pagan sun god worship rituals. However, the, the here's what the dictionary says about vernal equinox. It says either of the two points on the celestial sphere where the celestial equator intersects the ecliptic. Either of the two times of year, as about March 21st and September 23rd, when the sun crosses the equator and day and night are everywhere on earth of approximately equal length. Okay, so as you can see, this term equinox is simply a marking point for spring and autumn, where in both times of the year, the daytime and the nighttime are of equal length indicating that the earth has made a full revolution around the sun. This is how we know that it's a new solar year. Our creator's calendar is based off of these three heavenly luminaries. As I've said, and I'm going to repeat it again. Sorry for being so repetitious. The sun, the moon, and the stars. These are the three witnesses that testify that it's a new year. Okay. Um, some people are going only by the sun. Those are the Jubilee people that are going by the book of Jubilees, only the sun. And then, you know, Judaism, only the moon. And then you've got the people that are making the barley the number one witness. Okay. There's so many people that are out of balance because they're only, they're, they're focusing on one thing instead of taking the totality of all three witnesses. And then the barley, which is the fourth witness. I'll explain what I mean by that. So stay with me. So our Heavenly Father is the one who has the authority to know the times and the seasons. It says in Ma'asei Shlakim, Acts 1-7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times and the seasons, which the Father has put in his own power. So those who are trying to predetermine the calendar without him, without watching for the celestial bodies, without searching for the barley. They're just going by a prefabricated, prefixed, pre-calculated calendar. That's man trying to do it himself. Okay. Therefore, we cannot presumptuously predict when the new year begins. It is not determined by the Pope, nor by the rabbis within Judaism, nor by any scientist or astronomer. The times and the seasons are determined by our Heavenly Father, who has put these things into his own power. And it is he who has given us the method by which he wants us to measure them. Okay, now, just for time's sake, I'm not going to go into this explanation here because it's going to take a little bit of time. But I talk about understanding the two calendars in Scripture. There are actually two calendars in Scripture. Um, <clears throat> on the first day of the seventh month of Etanim, which today they call Tishri, that's actually measuring the civil calendar or the you know, the, the linear years, the linear years. Okay. That's called the birthday of the world. Okay. Um, so there's three harvest times in Israel. There's the barley harvest in the spring. Then there's the weed harvest at the time of feast of weeks or Shabuot Pentecost. And then the second weed harvest is in the fall. Okay. So I'm going to skip over this cause it's going to take too long to get through this. Um, but 
So let's talk about when is Passover in 2024. We do not know the exact date of Passover yet because we are still waiting for new moon watchers in Israel to report to us when the new moon of Abib is. We are expecting that it's going to be on April 9th or 10th. Once the new moon has been sighted, then we count 14 days until Passover or Pesach. If the moon is sighted on April 9th, we will be keeping Passover on the evening of April 22nd. If the new moon is sighted on April 10th, we will be keeping Passover on the evening of April 23rd. In the meantime, the spring equinox is on March 19th, telling us that we are in a new solar year. However, according to Deuteronomy 16.1, we must also reckon the new moon of the new year, and that is yet to be determined. Those who are searching for the right barley in Israel right now have not found enough barley to be ready to make first fruits wave sheaf offering in time for the Feast of First Fruits. Now, there are conflicting reports. I will give you that right now. There are conflicting reports. Some people are say that, saying they have found barley. And some are saying they have not found that there's not enough barley. Okay. Um, I saw a video the other day. Um, I think it was March 7th where Devorah Gordon, they show her going in the field and inspecting the barley and there was no barley. Okay. And you had mentioned that you heard some reports that said, yes, there is barley, but it's not at the stage that if you were to burn it, there would be anything left. Right. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and Yol Halevi, he's an Orthodox Jew that cites the barley, but he, what's interesting about him is he does use the sacred name of Yahuwah, which is unusual for, unusual for an Orthodox Jew. Normally, they just say Hashem, but he actually uses the Father's name, Yahuwah. Okay, he has not cited the barley, okay? Now, those who are keeping Pesach in March, they're keeping it in the month of the fish instead of the ram. Okay. Now the sign that we are keeping Passover in the correct month is that the ram should be visible over Jerusalem on April 23rd, 2024, which is the first day of Pes Pesach or Passover. Okay. Um, and I'm going to show you real quick. This, um, this is from the Stellarium software. Now, as you can see on April 13th, we're going to be able to see Pisces and Aries together, right? Near the sun. Okay. But then as 10 days later, you're going to be able to see Aries is moving closer to the sun. Pisces is kind of moving away from the sun. Okay. This is how we know that we're going to be doing it in the correct month. Okay, so those who are doing it in March, they're doing it in the month of the fish. Now, some people say, oh, well, where does it say that in Scripture? Well, it doesn't have to say it in Scripture. It says that we're supposed to, that the stars are there for times and for seasons. Now, I don't know about you, but I never saw in Scripture where a fish was offered up for the firstborn. I mean, have you ever seen anything in Scripture that says that a fish was offered up for the firstborn? Not me. I never saw anything that said the, the fish had his head caught in a thicket. Okay. I know I'm being, I'm being, you know, facetious, but look, I'm sorry. It's a sign. A sign doesn't require explicit details. It's a sign. Okay. It's a, you know, it's like a stop sign. It just says stop. It doesn't say, it doesn't give you a whole book full of instructions. It just says stop. Okay, it's the same thing with the constellation. It's a sign. Okay, a sign doesn't require a lot of explanation. It's a sign. Okay. <laughs> and signs are to be used in, uh, in conjunction with other signs. Exactly. It, it, it's a sum, right? It's the total sum. Exactly. Now, I've got this other blog, Time Season and the Thief in the Night. When is the real New Year? I, you know, recommend going there. Um, now, those... To those that are saying, oh, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us, you know, I've had these conversations with people who have abandoned the Torah for timekeeping and they're going with the book of Jubilees and they're saying, oh, the Bible doesn't tell us to to observe the new moon. They're saying, oh, the word moon is the word Yerach. 
Okay? So if you want to find the word Yerach in the Bible, here it is. Tehillim, Psalms 89.37. It says, it shall be established forever as the moon, Yerach, as a faithful witness in heaven. And then also in Psalms 104.19, it says, he appointed the moon, Yerach, for seasons. Moedim, feasts. The sun knows his going down. I mean, that is as clear as crystal. He appointed the moon, the Yereach, for seasons. Moedim. Okay. In uh, Yidamiyahu, Jeremiah 31, 35, thus says Yahuwah, which gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinance of the moon, Yereach. And the stars for a light by night, and the stars for a light by night, which divides the sea when the waves hereof roar. So he's telling us the gravitational pull of the moon and the stars divides the sea. It's, you know, it's the moon and the stars that cause, you know, uh, what do you call that when this when the waves of the ocean what do they call that? The tides. The tides, yeah. Um, in Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah 31, 36, if those ordinances depart from before me, says Yahuwah, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So, yeah, this word ordinances is hookah, okay? Not something you smoke, not a pipe, <laughs> Not something you vape. <laughs> that word hookah means appointed custom, a statute. And it comes from this other root word, hok, hok, which means commandment, law, measure, statute. So Yahuwah has actually given us the moon as a commandment, an ordinance. And he says, if those ordinances depart from before me, says Yahuwah, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. That's Jeremiah 31, 36. So those, those who have stopped sighting the new moon and are only going by the sun, they have way, way gone off the path. I'm talking big time, off the path. So when the quibbling over the barley does not solve things. I find that the Maserot, which is in Job 38, 32, the Maserot helps to verify when Passover has arrived. It's like the final cherry on top, if you will. It's like the final, you know, proof. Okay. And, you know, I've got this other blog here called, is there a difference between astronomy and astrology? Okay. I make a distinction in this blog for how we're supposed to use the stars the way Yahuwah has commanded us to use them, not the way the world uses them, okay? Not to those who question, well, where does it say in Scripture that we're supposed to use the stars? Well, in Genesis 37, Joseph saw in his dream that the sheaves bowed down to him. Well, this is a prophetic picture of our Messiah when all 11 tribes are going to bow down to him when he returns. He being from the tribe of Yehuda. Remember, it says in Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Yehuda, Judah. OK, that means all 11 tribes will bow down to him and he's going to be the lion of the tribe of Yehuda. So Joseph had a second dream, okay, that the sun, the moon, and the stars bowed down to him. This is yet another prophetic picture of the celestial bodies bowing down to our Messiah. Now, this is why I believe we should go by Genesis 1, 14 through 16 first. That's the first timekeeping piece, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then the sheaves of barley are the fourth witness. That's why I say this, because what came first in the Torah? The sun, the moon, and the stars. That's Those are the first three witnesses shown to us. 
And then the sheaves of barley, I believe, are a fourth witness. Now, that's not to say that we don't need the barley or that the barley is not important. It's just that the sun, the moon, and the stars lead us to the time when the barley will be automatically ripe. Therefore, if we focus first on the sun for the solar year, secondly, the moon for the new moon, and thirdly, the stars as the witness that we're in the correct month, the barley will naturally follow. Okay? I'm not saying that the barley isn't important. I'm just saying by focusing too much on the barley before the spring equinox, we end up getting ahead of Yahuwah. And that causes strife and division, which we're seeing right now. Okay? So it's sort of like following uh, a recipe to bake a cake, right? If the recipe tells us to bake the cake at 350 degrees for 30 minutes, we don't keep opening the oven door to check with a toothpick to see if the cake is done. If you do that, what's going to happen is the heat is going to escape from the oven and the cake's not going to get done. But if we trust the formula, we trust the recipe that Yahuwah has given us, then we can be sure that after the 30 minutes have elapsed, the cake is going to pass the toothpick test. That's what I mean when I say that the barley is the fourth witness. If we follow the pattern, sun first, moon second, stars third, barley fourth, we don't have to squabble over the barley. We just know that after we do those first three witnesses, sun, moon, stars, guess what? The barley is going to be ready when it's supposed to be ready. It's going to be ready on time. So here's why the barley is still important, and you would agree with this, is because if your calculation or if your interpretation of the sun and the moon and the stars is off, you'll know you're off if you're off early yeah. because the barley won't be ready, Right. which means you check the formula again. You check the recipe. Did I actually follow up properly? Oh, you know, I, I, I messed up the definition of, of uh, the circuit of the moon. Right. Or, or I mean, sorry, the circuit of the sun, or something like that, right? So, the barley is important, but it's it's like the fail safe. You know, if the barley's not ready, mm -hmm. broadly speaking, as it needs to be, then you've done something wrong in the first three. Right, exactly. So, um, I'm looking for the blog that I have called "Except Those Days Should Be Shortened," because some people will say, "Well, where does it say that there's gonna there should be a thirteenth month in the Bible?" Okay, <clears throat> the reason there are 13 months, as I've already just explained, and, and I recommend going to this blog, except those days should be shortened. The reason why we have 13 months is because the rotation, the Earth's rotation around the sun has been, t you know, taken, um, taken longer, five days longer than it used to be. And that's because of the curse. The curse, you know, um, in the garden, okay, things have been uneven, you know. But what's going to happen is in the days of the two witnesses, we're going back to 1,260 days for the three and a half years. That's a 360-day year. So once the earth is turned upside down, and we read about that in, um, you know, in... Um, Isaiah uh, 24, it tells us in Isaiah 24, verse 1, that um, the earth is going to be turned upside down. And that's talking about the magnetic poles. And when we see that, we know that Yahuwah is positioning the one new man. It says, behold, Yahuwah makes the earth empty. And I looked up that word, em that word in Bakak, and it literally means to depopulate. He's doing that, okay? And to make it waste, okay? And turns it upside down. He's turning it upside down, okay? He's, we're going back to the days of Noah where every month is exactly 30 days. The reason why we, there's a need for a, a 13th month of Adar is because our months are not even. Some months are 30 days, some months are 29 and a half, OK, and because of this, we have this uneven calendar. 
Okay. And so every so often we have to make up for it by having a 13th month. Well, 13th, the number 13 is a prophetic picture of the house of Ephraim. Ephraim is the 13th tribe. And there are actually 13 constellations. So why, you, you know, there is a pattern for 13. Uh, let's see if I can find it. There is a pattern for 13. I know people think, oh, that doesn't seem biblical. But see, Scripture never tells us that, you know, the... Uh, so there, there's, okay, there's 12 tribes of Israel, but the 13th tribe is Ephraim. And so there are 13 constellations altogether. They're not shown on this chart, but Ephraim is one of the tribes. He's the 13th tribe. Remember, Jacob blessed Ephraim and gave him the blessing that belonged to Simeon and Reuben and said that Ephraim and Manasseh are my firstborn sons. So he gave them both the blessing of the firstborn. And Manasseh is the 14th tribe. So yeah, altogether there are 14 tribes, but the 14th have been absorbed into the 12. That's why in Revelation 7, only 12 of them are named. But um, I'm going to stop here because we have to move on to the next teaching. But um, we have a little bit of time to uh, take a few questions, and then we're moving on to the next teaching. All right. Let me give those in Zoom the priority. So in Zoom, you all can uh, unmute yourselves. Mm -hmm. There was Lynn's quick to the draw. Mm -hmm. Lynn? Oh, yeah, hi. Okay. Um, so the first poll here... Was that during the flood where the days were changed from 360 to 364? 365. Excuse me, 365. Yeah, what about it? Did that happen, the first pole shift, did that happen during the flood? Yeah, that's what I've actually, that's what I found in my research, that, uh, that the pole shift, there must have been a, you know, there was obviously a pole shift in the days of the flood, which is why the earth takes 365.25 days now to traverse or make a revolution around the sun. But in the days of Noah, we know it was a 360 day year because it talks about 150 days. The, the, the waters or the ark rested upon the waters for 150 days. And then after 150 days, the waters abated. So 150 days is 150 um, d divided by five would be exactly 30 day months. So every month in the days of the flood were 30 days. So that's how we know that during the days of the, uh, Noah, every month was 30 days. But right now, the way it is, is some months are 30 days and then some months are 29 and a half. And so that's why things are off. They're off. And that's why there's always a need for a, a leap year to, you know, to make up for the dis discrepancy. And so some people say, oh, well, that's not biblical. Yeah, but who has caused it to be that way? I mean, we're still living in a fallen world. And to try to fix it is like getting ahead of him. And it's like, why not wait for him to fix it? He's going to fix it. But it's not up to us to go, oh, daddy, you need our help. We're going to fix the calendar for you. Like, yeah, it sounds it sounds good, but that's not, you know, in the days of the two witnesses, we're going back to a 360 day year. So those who are going by the Jubilee calendar, which is a 364 day calendar, it's a, it's an exercise in futility. They're doing that for nothing because we're going back to 360 day year anyway. You know, I know we all know this in principle. Yeah. And sometimes we have to, you know, show our, our kids this, but we ourselves as the adults are the children or the bride of Yahuwah. Yeah. We have to remember that the process is often as important as the miracle. Yeah. You know, the way he does something, the way he goes about the solution to the problem is for our benefit and for his purposes. Right. So... To, you know, yeah, it would be nice to have it all clean and tidy and we can do a perfect calculation and never have to watch. Yeah. Never have to be left wondering, waiting up until 
the last you know, minute, the last fifteen days before to make our final plans. Right. But he has it that way for a reason, and if no other reason, then we are dependent upon him. We cannot do it in our own strength. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, you know, so people that say, oh, that 13th day, that's not biblical. Well, it actually is. I mean, even though the Bible never mentions the 13th month, the fact that we do have to go by the new moons, we do have to go by the sun, the moon, and the stars, it ends up being that we do have to go. There's going to always be a 13th month of Adar because our our rotation of the earth around the sun is it's a little bit off kilter because we're in a fallen world. Yeah. But, but um, yeah. So is there a question to, to bring this to a head? No, that's just all I needed. Okay. Thanks sister. Anybody else? And uh, your friend Perry is on the YouTube stream. And um, Oh yeah. I'd love to hear for what you have to say, Perry. Well, he, he said, great job. He, he loved the explanation and the question, I think. <laughs> um, anybody else? Dan, um, Mr. David, Jack, Jason, uh, Scott, Valerie. Anybody else you want to open the mic or someone in the YouTube chat? You can type something. And if not, we will move on to subject number two within this stream. Hi, Gary. Hey, Scott. Hey, um, seven times 52 is 364. Yes, it is. So, in, yeah, in that regard, is this where this, um, Veda calendar is coming up with 364 days or any mess, anything on that? Um, I didn't catch it from the very beginning, so I'm not sure whether this was answered or not, but I'm just curious. Yes, exactly. So, I know they're calling it the Zadok calendar, but there's no real evidence for the fact that the book of Jubilees was penned by the Zadok priesthood. That's an assumption that some people are making. Um, it's more likely that it was the Essenes who were part of the Qumran community that penned the book of Jubilees and it's from the second century BC. Um, there are problems with the book of Jubilees because um, there are things in the book of Jubilees that are not, that do not align with scripture. Like as an example, I can find it here. Book of Jubilees says, I'm going to this blog here, is the solar calendar book of in the book of Jubilees biblical? I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom here, and I'm going to just cite some things. Um, so the book of Jubilees claims it's a sin to fast on the Sabbath days. Okay, now if that's true, our Messiah fasted for 40 days in the wilderness which means he fasted for five Sabbaths. So that would have yes, meant that he, he was sinning, right? The Book of Jubilees claims that uh, it's a sin to go to war on the Sabbath. But see, our Messiah said, commanded us to save life on the Sabbath. Okay, if somebody comes to your home ready to kill you and your family on Shabbat, you are commanded to, def to defend your family and yourself because this is the command of our Messiah to save life. See, some people get so letter of the law, they miss the entire point of what the Sabbath is all about. The Sabbath is made for man, man. In other words, he made Sabbath for us. The Sabbath shouldn't be elevated to the place where it no longer serves a purpose to humanity. If, if following the Sabbath means you have to let people die on the Sabbath, then it serves no purpose anymore, right? Amen. Amen. Correct. So, you know, and Yahuwah commanded Israel to march around Jericho for seven days. This means on the seventh day, it was the Sabbath. And okay. let's be clear, on the seventh day, the walls didn't just fall and the fires didn't just start. They ran up into the City, city and slaughtered everyone the giants yeah, exactly the giants so that was warfare he gave them the command to march around jericho on the shabbat and some people say but we're supposed to rest on the sabbath yes we're supposed to be resting from our own works see that's where people miss it you go to isaiah chapter 58 and he commands us to rest from our own works like example 
Some people are so caught up in their business and wanting to earn a living that they'll be looking at their, you know, portfolio, their their financial portfolio on Shabbat. That's a no-no. We're not supposed to be concerning ourselves with the things of this world. Our own affairs. Right. Um, if you're if you're obsessed with football or baseball or sports and you keep checking to see the score and it's Shabbat and you're you know you're supposed to be studying the Torah at the you know and you keep looking at your phone to see the score. Look, your 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 head's in the wrong place. Okay, we're not supposed to be so focused on the world. It's a day to put away, to put aside the things of this world and fix our eyes on him. Okay? That's why in Amen. Isaiah 58, 13, he says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure. See, your pleasure is different than his pleasure, right? On my yeah, yeah. on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of Yahuwah, honorable and shall honor him, not doing your own ways. I know people that left the Torah because they wanted their children to play soccer on the Sabbath day. And they were like, oh, our other kids in, in their school are playing soccer. And, you know, we don't want our children to feel deprived. Well, is you may. Is that mind blowing or what? It is. That, that blows my mind. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, I know it's a it's a difficult time that we live in. And, and that would be a hard decision to make. And I get that. But I'm sorry. You know, it. You're going to pay the price for choosing soccer over Yahuwah. He says, not, do, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then shall you delight yourself in Yahuwah, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. Well, what does that mean? The high places of the earth. Well, remember when in Ephesians, the apostle Shaul says, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. So if we ride upon the high places, what does that mean? That we conquer the principalities. We have authority over them. Places of authority. That yeah. we have authority over them. In other words, if you keep Shabbat, you have authority in the heavenlies over these powers and principalities. And he says, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, Jacob, your father. Well, I don't know about you, but I would love to, to be fed with the heritage of Jacob, right? Because... He borrowed his father-in-law's cattle, and what did he do? He multiplied them. Jacob, yeah, Jacob, Jacob had the dreams, and he was shown how to propagate these cattle, and and all of his cattle kept multiplying, where Laban's cattle were not multiplying, and he left Laban, and he left Laban. And took all the cattle that he propagated with him because that was the deal that they had, you know. So he's telling us that if we keep his Shabbat, not doing our own pleasure, doing his pleasure, that we will have authority in the heavenly realms. We will, you know, be made more than conquerors. Right. And so. Amen. So, but, so the book of Jubilee says it's a sin for married couples to be intimate on the Sabbath day. But see, Yahuwah commanded Adam and Eve on the sixth day, at the end of the sixth day, he finishes making them, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, and this is just about the, you know, the seventh day is just about to begin, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. Well, if a husband impregnates his wife on Shabbat, is he not saving the life of that egg? Of course, Messiah commands us to save life on the Sabbath day. Okay, so it's not a sin for couples. In fact, I would go as far as to say that the best time for couples to get married and to consummate is on the Sabbath. Why? Because the seventh day of the week is a microcosm of the seventh millennium when Messiah returns for his bride. And that's when we're going to consummate with him and have the marriage supper of the lamb. 
Okay. See, people miss the whole point of the Shabbat. They get so letter of the law, they miss the prophetic. They miss the prophetic purpose of what Shabbat is about. And they, they get so nitpicky. And, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be strict. We should be strict about how we keep Shabbat. But we have to keep in mind, bearing in mind, this is a prophetic picture of Messiah and his bride. Everything in scripture is always taking us back to that marriage relationship. So, Amen. so yeah, Amen. I, I am all in favor of couples being fruitful, multiplying uh-huh. on Shabbat because, because it's doing his pleasure. If he already said, be fruitful and multiply. And I've heard people say, Oh, but that's doing your own pleasure. No, it's not. It's doing his pleasure. <laughs> Because yeah, first man. <laughs> because the devil is always trying to drive a wedge between married couples, right? He's yeah. always trying to prevent pregnancies, right? The devil's notorious yeah. for, for preventing pregnancies. He wants us to practice birth control and abortions. And, you know, you have all these things trying to prevent us from being fruitful and multiplying. So, If the devil can add one more thing by making himself sound so pious and holy and going, oh, couples should abstain on Shabbat. So now what? They're disobeying the command to be fruitful and multiply. That came first. You know? So, yeah. So this is why I don't advocate the book of. And also the book of Jubilees um, abandons the new moon. They say. Oh, you know, we're only supposed to follow the solar calendar. But it tells us right here in Psalms 104, 19, he appointed the moon for seasons. And that word seasons is Moedim. So, so, you know, we can't ignore the moon. And, you know, but this is what's happening. People are, this were in the last days, there's a great falling away taking place. And people are abandoning the five books of Moses and going to this book called Jubilees. Like I said, I'm not against these extra biblical writings as far as historical record. There's, that's fine. But we cannot treat this book as if it's scripture. It contradicts Amen. them. You know, I mean... It contradicts scripture. So we can't treat this book as like it's a book. It's not scripture. You know, the first five books of Moses is the that's the plumb line. You know, that's the plumb line. So um, does anybody else? uh, Was there a question, Scott, to go along with? Well, did I answer your question? You've answered all the questions in my heart right there. And just that that answer you gave so thank you awesome hallelujah thank you thank you so much Um, amen thank you anyone else anyone oh we got i think we got someone just jumping from youtube into zoom so they can ask a question it's a friend of lynn's okay hey shabbat shalom perry i think Ask him to unmute and see if that makes it easier. Perry, do you have a comment or question? Okay, maybe not. Maybe he's just going to hang out there. Okay, Okay. so we're going to just move right into the next subject. Now, um, you know, when this is over, we're going to turn the first teaching into a separate video. And then this, this teaching here will be another separate video. But for now, they're just combined. That way we don't have to force everybody to jump off the the stream, okay? All right, so this teaching is called Up Until the 14th Day and Between the Two Evenings. So I've been observing Passover since the year 2002, following the events of 9-11-2001. That was a pivotal year for me, as Yahuwah taught me many things during this time. He also shifted my paradigm regarding the vain traditions of men that many of us were taught within the Christian church. Since that time, I have seen many disputes and schisms within the body of Messiah regarding when to begin keeping Passover. Ever since I first began observing the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, I've always understood that there are two separate feasts to be kept on two separate nights. 
I became perplexed when I saw that many were celebrating both feasts on only one night as they were following the time frame of, of the temple Passover slaughter. Now, I would later on learn that the Pharisees in our Messiah's day had begun consolidating both feasts into one night by celebrating both feasts, Passover and unleavened bread on the night of the 15th of Abib. The problem I have with this is that it essentially means we are only keeping six annual festivals instead of seven, as we are commanded in Leviticus 23. After many years of studying the scriptures, I came to the realization that the dividing point to this entire conundrum lies in the fact that many people seem to ignore or misunderstand what it says in Exodus 12, 6. I also find it interesting that the number 12 to the number of this verse, you have to understand when the scriptures were first penned by Moses, there was no numbers to these verses. It was the uh, English translators that, you know, or I might have even been the, the Greek Septuagint, the, the Septuagint translators, the translators added the numbers to these verses. But I, I believe Yahuwah was even involved in that because it's interesting that the number 12 to this verse is being in divided, being divided by the number six, which is the number of man, because, you know, we were created on the sixth day. So this seems to imply that the 12 tribes are being divided over these two evenings and when to begin keeping the Passover. So Shemot Exodus 12, six says, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now reading this verse in Hebrew it says, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the two evenings. Bain ha-arbaim. Arbaim means between the evenings. Now, the first thing I would like to address is the meaning of the phrase up until. In Exodus 12, 6, the Hebrew word is ad, A-D which literally means as far as, as far as. Okay, imagine for a moment you are teaching your teenager how to drive a car. You are in the passenger seat while he or she is at the wheel as the driver. You say to your son or your daughter, I want you to drive as far as the stop sign. It should be obvious that you want him or her to drive right up until the stop sign. However, what if your teenager keeps on driving past the stop sign? See, that's what would have happened if Israel had waited till the next day to slaughter the lamb in Egypt at three o'clock in the afternoon. They would have still been roasting their lamb on the night of the 15th of Abib. After they had eaten of the Passover meal, they were instructed to stay inside their homes until the morning. Okay, and that's in Exodus 12, 22. If they had slaughtered their lamb late in the afternoon at 3 p.m. on the 14th of Abib, which is when our Messiah was crucified, it means they would have been roasting their lamb after sundown on the 15th of Abib. This means they would still have been preparing to leave Egypt all that day, on the 15th of Abib, and it means they would not have left Egypt until the 16th of Abib, okay? Therefore, we have to conclude that Israel was commanded to keep the lamb, oops, went too far here, keep the lamb right up until sundown on the 13th of Abib. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us that it means right up until the 13th of, or, you know, the 13th of Abib, right up until the 14th of Abib, but it's implied. And I'll show you more evidence for this, so stay with me. Okay, it was not until the following evening of the 15th of Abib that they actually left Egypt. Okay, Scripture tells us they left on the 15th 
at night. At night. Let's look at this. Exodus 12, 42. Let's look at Exodus 12, 42. Okay. Exodus 12, 42. It says, um, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of Yahuwah went out from the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto Yahuwah for bringing them out from the land of Mitzrayim. This is that night of Yahuwah to be observed of all the children of Israel and their generations. Now, Think about this logically. If they're leaving at night, but if they would have slaughtered the lamb the same night that they left Egypt, then they were told not to leave their homes until the next morning. Okay. So this had to have been, okay. It had to have been that they slaughtered the lamb the previous night, right? The previous evening on the 14th. Okay. Um, let's look at, uh, Deuteronomy 16, one Deuteronomy 16, one says observe. And that word observe is shamar, which means to watch narrowly for, to be a watchman, to observe the Kodesh. That would be the new moon of Abib and keep the Pesach unto Yahuwah, your Elohim for in the month of of Abib, Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought you forth out of Mitzrayim by night. Okay, so they left at night, following the pillar of fire by night. And then finally, we want to look at Numbers 33, 3. Numbers 33, 3. And it says, and they departed from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which Yahuwah had smitten among them upon their gods. Also, Yahuwah executed judgments. Now, this was the same time that our Messiah's body was being taken off the cross and they buried him. You see the parallel there? The same time the, the Egyptians were burying their dead is when our Messiah's body was taken down off the cross and they had to do it before sundown, okay? And they buried him in the tomb before sundown. Uh, this was still the 14th of Abib when they took his body down, Okay. And scripture tells us in the book of John, in the gospel of John, that the reason they had to do this is because the Feast of Unleavened Bread was approaching and they're not allowed to keep the bodies on the cross all night long. They have to be taken down before the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. Okay. All right. So. This explains that there were two nights. The first night was when they slaughtered the lamb and placed the blood on their doorposts and they stayed in the whole night. The following night is when they left Egypt. Say, so we're going to talk about these two nights. All right, let's, let's look at the Hebrew word for up until. Okay, it's the word ad, A-D. And that's interesting because Yahushua died in 30 A.D., A.D. means Anno Domini in Latin, which means the year of our Lord. Okay. <laughs> A.D. As far as. Okay. As far as up to. Okay. To the degree of. To the point that. As far or long as much as. Okay. That's what this word means. In other words, he didn't say wait until there's only two hours left in the day of the 14th. And then slaughter your lamb. Okay. He didn't say that. He said, you keep the lamb right up until the date changes to the 14th, to the 14th of Abib. Let's keep talking. Let's just stay with me. We're, we're going to learn something here. Okay. So let's talk about the difference between the temple era and the phrase between the two evenings. So during the temple era in Jerusalem, the phrase between the two evenings, Bain Ha 
Arbaim came to mean something different than what it meant at that first Passover in Egypt. It is important to understand that during temple times, the phrase between the two evenings meant between 12 noon and sundown, which is around 6 p.m. That time of year, would have, would, it would have been uh, around the equinox, there would have been exactly, you know, the sun probably went down around 6 p.m. There were two daily sacrifices offered during temple times. The first one was at nine o'clock in the morning, which is called the third hour of the day in all the gospels. This is when our Messiah was first nailed to the tree. The second sacrifice was done at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. This is this second sacrifice of the day is referred to as between the two evenings because it, it's between 12 noon and 6 p.m. In our Western culture, we call this post meridian. Post meridian p.m. means that period between 12 noon and 6 o'clock in the evening. In other words, the phrase between the evenings, according to temple protocol, is from 12 noon until the sun goes down, which is generally around 6 to 7 p.m. in Jerusalem. Now, I have a PDF file here that you can download, and it explains this, what I'm talking about, what the phrase between the evenings means as it relates to the temple era. All four gospels, uh, in all four gospels, according to all four gospels, our Messiah was first crucified in the third hour of the day, which is nine o'clock a.m. And he died at 3 p.m., the sixth hour of the day. Thus, he fulfilled the timing of the morning and the evening sacrifices according to temple protocol. OK, so this means that he fulfilled all the temple sacrifices. He fulfilled the morning and the evening sacrifices by being crucified at 9 a.m. and then dying at 3 p.m. But he also fulfilled the temple Passover sacrifice by dying between the two evenings, which is between 12 noon and 3 p.m. All right, now let's talk about darkness between 12 noon and 3 o'clock. Okay, so it gets even better because there was a prophetic sign of darkness that fell over the earth between the sixth hour of the day, which is 12 noon, and the ninth hour of the day, which is 3 p.m. This was a heavenly sign. It was an anomaly that indicated that our Messiah, who is referred to as the Son of Righteousness in Malachi 4.2, he was dying for the sins of humanity. And Luke 23, 44, it says, and it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. In Luke 23, 45, it says, and the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. In other words, it was torn in the middle. Luke 23, 46. And when Yahushua had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the spirit. All right, let's talk about a more ancient meaning for between the two evenings. Okay, at the time of the Exodus, the phrase between the two evenings literally meant between the two sunsets on the 14th of Abib. This can be substantiated in many historical documents, which I cite at the end of this blog. Okay, it's too lengthy for me to go into, but if you really want to do the research, I give you this, the, the, uh, the sources at, in this blog at the end. As a matter of fact, the words sundown and evening in the Hebrew concordance have the same meaning and are used interchangeably. So the word Arab, which is what we use for evening, comes from the word Arab, like, you know, Arabia, Arab, okay? It means to grow dusky at sundown, to be darkened toward evening. So it's a mixture. There's still some light left. So it's like a mixture of light and darkness, okay? 
Yahuwah, in his divine wisdom, knew that the two kingdoms of Israel were going to be divided after King Solomon died. Therefore, he ordained, I believe he ordained that Passover was to be kept between the two sunsets on the 14th of Abib or Nisan for both divided houses. Okay, I believe he deliberately caused Pesach to be this way so that when Messiah came, he could do two things. He could eat the Passover at the beginning of the 14th of Abib, and the very next day he would actually become the Passover, and, and he would actually be fulfilling everything in one fell swoop. He would be fulfilling the temple protocol but he would also be fulfilling the Passover for both houses. Okay? So it is important to understand that with the first Passover in Egypt, there was no temple in Jerusalem. Therefore, each family slaughtered their own lamb at home. And this was a personal family affair. Each father or leader of his own household acted as the priest of his home who made blood atonement for his own family. Later on in first century Jerusalem, this tradition of a family Passover for each home continued. This was especially true for the Samaritans who were banned by the Yehudim, the Jews from participating at the temple. They continued with the ancient way of slaughtering a lamb for their own households at the beginning of the 14th of Abib. Therefore, in keeping with the command to slaughter the lamb between the two sunsets, the Sadducees and the Samaritans, along with the Northern Kingdom of Israel, conducted a Passover slaughter within their own households on the evening of the 13th of Abib going into the 14th of Abib. Okay, so this means as soon as the sun went down on the 13th of Abib, the date changed to the 14th of Abib. Now, I know that right now there's a lot of quibbling about when a calendar date changes. Whatever you do, do not conflate the word daylight with calendar date okay they're not the same thing the daylight hours are from six o'clock in the morning till 6 p.m our messiah said are there not 12 hours in the day he's talking about daylight hours that's not the same thing as when a calendar date changes a calendar date changes when the sun goes down at the end of the 12 hour day the end of something is when something new begins. Wouldn't you agree? When you get to the end of the movie, you're watching a DVD and you see the credits rolling and it says the end. What happens on that DVD? It goes back to the beginning of the movie, doesn't it? So at the end of the movie, the movie starts over again, right? So it's at the end that the beginning starts. <laughs> okay. Conversely, the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin conducted their Passover slaughter at the temple on the following evening from 12 noon to 6 p.m. So they weren't wrong in doing that. Both houses of Israel were doing it at different times. But see, this was by design. I believe Yahuwah designed it that way on purpose. That way, everyone would be included. As a matter of fact, the Jewish historian Josephus recorded that there were oftentimes over a million pilgrims coming from the surrounding tribes to have their lambs slaughtered by the priests. Therefore, it became necessary to have two evenings for slaughtering lambs. Two evenings. Now, by following the chronology of, of events from the per first Passover in Egypt to our Messiah's gospel Passover, we can easily see that Yahushua followed the same patterns and in the same order as Israel did in Egypt. Okay, this means that our Messiah 
ate the Passover meal at the same time that Israel and Egypt ate the Passover meal at the beginning of the 14th of Abib. Here's the explanation. In Egypt, Israel slaughtered the lamb at the beginning of the 14th of Abib. This would be after sundown on the 13th of Abib. Remember, Exodus 12, 6 commands, commanded them to keep the lamb up until the 14th of Abib before killing the lamb. As I've already illustrated, the phrase up until means as far as. Okay, this means that as the sun was going down on the 13th day of the first month of Abib, when it became the 14th of Abib, that's when they slaughtered the lamb. Okay, so our Messiah fulfilled both time frames for both houses. Number one, he ate the Passover inside the house with the kingdom of Judah on the first night of the 14th of Abib. Remember, everybody in Jerusalem was keeping Passover. Okay, so they were all in the house. And the in the house didn't just mean inside their physical home. It meant inside the kingdom. Okay, because the kingdom of Judah was called the house of Judah. So they were in the house. Okay, the next day he became the Passover for those who were afar off. Now, this phrase afar off is often used to describe Ephraim, the 13th tribe, those who were afar off. And later Judah disqualified themselves also that same morning. They shouted crucify him. And when they did that, they disqualified themselves. Okay. Therefore, just like the red heifer ordinance in Numbers 19.3, our Messiah was escorted outside the camp. It tells us in Numbers 19.3 that the red heifer is to be escorted outside the camp. In fact, it's the only sacrifice that's done outside the camp. All other sacrifices were done in the temple. So why did he have to become like the pattern of the red heifer because the purpose of the red heifer was so that whenever they shed innocent blood, whenever some dead body was found in the land and nobody knew how this person had died or, you know, or they shed innocent blood, the whole entire nation was guilty of that innocent blood. So what they did was they escorted a perfect spotless red heifer outside the camp. And at the base of the Mount of Olives is where they slaughtered these red heifers and they burned it down to ashes. The ashes of the heifer became like a cleaning solution. This is how they make soap even to this day, like lye soap. You know, we, we've heard the term Lysol, Lysol. You know, lye soap is made from ashes, volcanic ash, you know, ashes act like a cleansing agent. And so they mix these ashes with water and they make what they call lye soap. Well, and it's not just volcanic ashes, acid, ashes for any, any fire. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying like, that's what's used to make soap. OK, so they used this was such a powerful cleansing agent that they literally had to wear gloves because it was because it would burn their skin. And so they would use this cleansing agent to clean all the articles in the temple. So you can imagine the night before he's eating the Passover with the kingdom of Judah. They hadn't left the house yet. They hadn't disqualified themselves yet. The next day in the morning, they're shouting, crucify him. Now what? They're all guilty of innocent blood. That means later that day when they performed the Passover sacrifice at the temple, that Passover sacrifice would have been considered null and void, not acceptable to the father in heaven. Because why? They shouted, crucify him. The whole nation was guilty of innocent blood, of shedding innocent blood. Their temple altar was defiled. Now, what does he do? He is escorted outside the camp like the red heifer because it's his 
blood alone that sanctified the altar. If he hadn't have done what he did, their Passover would have been considered disqualified. Okay. Now, anecdotally, I want to offer that the ashes of, of the red heifer, just like they're used to clean yeah. and to to cleanse the nation from, you know, innocent blood, the, the ashes were also used to um, to prepare any new instrument that was like worn out in the temp- tabernacle, right? So the the first time something went into service, it was also those same ashes were washed and cleansed, right? So. That's why, you know, in today's time, the, there's a big to-do about a red heifer. That's right. You have to have the same ashes to institute all the pieces. That's right. All the, everything to have a temple. So. That's right. And a lot of people that don't understand, that are kind of ignorant about this, they go, oh, oh, that red heifer, what's that all about? Who cares? That's just, oh, that's just, you know, the Jews doing all this stuff that's no longer necessary. And, you know, a lot of people don't get it. It's a prophetic picture. The red heifer is a prophetic picture of Messiah. He's allowing the red heifer ashes to be a prophetic picture of him. And he wants the Yahudim, the Jews of this generation, to see that, to recognize him. Now, some of them won't see it, but some of them will. Okay? So it has to take place. People need to understand the red heifer is a big deal because it's prophetic of Messiah. Okay? And I believe they're going to be probably slaughtering those red heifers this year for Passover. Okay? And look, I know there's a lot of quibbling about when to keep Passover, but if Yahuwah is going to allow the kingdom of Judah to slaughter, slaughter the red heifers at Passover time, which I believe that's probably when they're going to do it, that's going to be prophetic. And I believe that too is a sign that that's the true Passover is Yahushua is going to be allowing them to slaughter the red heifer at that time. As a prophetic picture of him. Because what is the heifer symbolic of? Okay. If we're looking at constellations. Okay. Constellations. Let's look at at the constellation of um, the bull. Taurus the bull represents Joseph. Right. So we're going to be moving uh, towards the end of April. Keeping Pesach At the tail end of April, at the tail end of the ram. And guess what? Taurus the bull, which is like a picture of the red heifer that represents Ephraim. Remember, it says that Ephraim is in the hand of Joseph or the stick of Joseph is in the hand of Ephraim, I should say. That's in Ezekiel 37. So the tribe of Ephraim is absorbed into the tribe of Joseph. So Ephraim is the 13th tribe. Okay. So I believe the reason why we're keeping Pesach so late in the year this year is because Judah and Ephraim are becoming like one stick slowly, ever so gradually. We're seeing that the two sticks are becoming one. Okay. That's why I, that's what I'm seeing. Okay. So let's talk about the chronology of both Passovers. At the Exodus Passover, Israel ate the Passover meal while the first, while the Egyptian firstborn were being smitten. Okay. That's a key word, smitten. On that night of the 14th of Abib, Yahuwah said he would smite the Egyptians. Exodus 12, 23. In the gospel Passover, it says that the shepherd would be smitten for sinners. So on that night of the 14th of Abib, Yahushua repeated the prophecy of Zechariah 13, 7, when he said, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. And he said this in Matthew 26, 31, and he said it again. Well, of course, it's Mark 14, 27, same account. Okay. Okay. So here we have an artist's depiction. You've got the, the angel passing over the home of the Israelites because he sees the blood on the doorpost. Okay. And in the background, you can see the Egyptian obelisk 
Okay, that's kind of a symbol the artist gave us to show us this is in Egypt, okay? And you see the dead Egyptian bodies laying around, and you see the Israelites in their home, and they're keeping the Passover meal, okay, as a family. And now you see what a lot of people refer to as the Last Supper. And by the way, there's not one word of the Last Supper. The term Last Supper cannot be found in Scripture. People who call it the Last Supper are avoiding the obvious. This was a Passover meal. Okay, He was eating the Passover with, with his disciples on the same night, the 14th of Abib, the beginning of the 14th of Abib. This was the same night that Israel ate their Passover meal, okay, in Egypt. Okay, the Exodus Passover, uh, Moses and Aaron were summoned. See, on that same night of the 14th of Abib, Moses and Aaron were summoned by Pharaoh, Exodus 1230. Now, they were told to stay indoors the whole night and not to leave until the morning. So we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us, but I'm assuming that probably Pharaoh sent a couple of his soldiers or messengers to give the, uh, you know, to give the message to Moses and Aaron, and they probably didn't go until the next morning. They probably told uh, the messenger, you know, tell Pharaoh we can't come until morning. That's what I'm assuming, okay? Because they were commanded not to leave their homes until morning. Because as soon as Pharaoh's firstborn son was dead at midnight, that's when he called for them. Okay, but it doesn't say they went. It just says he called for them. Okay, now the gospel Passover, Messiah was summoned on the same night of the 14th of Abib. Messiah was arrested and he was brought to Caiaphas, the high priest. That's in Matthew 26, 55 through 68. Okay, so the same time that Moses and Aaron were summoned to Pharaoh was the same time that our Messiah was summoned to the Sanhedrin. Okay. The Exodus Passover, Pharaoh's firstborn son smitten by the plague. Okay. On the morning of the 14th of Abib, uh, Pharaoh released Israel when he realized that his firstborn son had become the substitute for Israel, whom Yahuwah named my firstborn son. He called the whole nation my firstborn son. That's in Exodus 4.22 and also in Exodus 12.29 through 32. So the gospel Passover, our Messiah as the firstborn son, you know, he came to represent the nation of Israel. He came to represent the whole nation. He was smitten for sinners, smitten for sinners. Okay. On the morning of the 14th of Abib, Pontius Pilate released Bar Abba. That Bar Abba is the Aramaic name for Barabbas. Barabbas is the Greek uh, rendition of this name, but Bar Abba literally means son of the father. So you see Barabbas was a prophetic symbol of the nation of Israel. He was the sinner. The whole nation of Israel had sinned. Okay. In exchange for Yahushua, Yahushua became the substitute for the firstborn sons which is Israel. Barabbas, his name, bar Abba, really means son of the father. So he was a prophetic symbol of the whole nation. He committed insurrection. But our Messiah was, was falsely accused of insurrection. See, Yahushua was the firstborn of many brethren. He became the substitute for the whole nation. And I give all the scripture citations here. Now, the, at the Exodus Passover, Pharaoh finally answered the request of the people when Aaron and Moses said, let Israel go free. Okay. On the morning of the 14th of Abib, Pharaoh finally answered the cry of Moses and Aaron, let my people go. 
Okay, Exodus 12, 31 through 32. In the gospel Passover, Pontius Pilate answered the request of the people when they shouted, let Barabbas go. Okay, so, so on the morning of the 14th of Abib, Pontius Pilate finally answered the cry of the people, let Barabbas go. That's Luke 23, 18. So Barabbas is a prophetic picture of the sinners, the nation of Israel. They were guilty of sin. And he being Bar Abbas, son of the father, deserved death. But he was set free and our Messiah went in his place. As a matter of fact, the word scapegoat in Hebrew Azazel means goat of departure. Okay. But in the English dictionary, the word scapegoat literally means the guilty party, or I'm sorry, the innocent party, I should say, the innocent party who takes the place of the guilty party. That's what the word scapegoat means. And our Messiah literally was the innocent son who took the place of the guilty son. Okay, that's why he came in the role of the firstborn son. See, he was the eternal father. He was the everlasting father, according to Isaiah 9, 6. But the everlasting father came in human flesh, put on human flesh and became like the guilty sinners, the son. He wasn't a sinner. Scripture says he never sinned. He was tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. He was not a sinner, but he took the place of the guilty party. Okay, so here we got um, an artist's depiction of Pharaoh. His firstborn son is dead. Okay, and here we've got Israel. Barabbas represents the firstborn son, and he deserves death, but he goes free. And our Messiah, who's the innocent party, takes his place. Okay, so... The Exodus Passover, Israel baked dough before it had risen. Okay. Then they departed being led by a pillar of fire. Okay. Um, in Exodus 12, 34, it says, and the people took their dough before it was risen. In other words, before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And then in verse 39, it says, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough. In other words, from the dough. Okay. Now, some people would argue that they brought raw dough out of Egypt. I mean, I've had this controversy before, but no, they didn't bring raw dough out of Egypt. They had to bake it before it was leavened. Okay. If they would have brought it out of Egypt, it would have started fermenting. I know this because... We just had a, I just had some pancake batter in the, in the refrigerator in a jar and it was there for a whole week. And after a week I went to make the pancakes and they were sourdough pancakes. They were, they were fermented, it was fermented pancakes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Cause I just, I had put it in the freezer and I took it out of the freezer and I forgot to make them. So a whole week went by. And now the dough was fermented. Okay. So if they had waited to take, to bake these cakes, then it would have started f fermenting. So they had to bake the cakes before they were risen. Just like our Messiah was placed in the tomb before he was risen. Okay. So Exodus twelve thirty nine says, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt. Uh, somebody had read this one time with me and they were like arguing with me that they brought raw dough out of Egypt. All it's saying is that the unleavened cakes came from the dough. But it says they baked the cakes from the dough. And then what? They brought those out of Egypt. Okay. And it says for it was not risen. It was not leavened yet. So had they waited, if, if they would have stopped along the side of the road, and you have to understand there were 600,000 men on foot 
not including the women and the children. If you if you factor in the women and the children, there's probably over a million people. If somebody had said, everybody stop, we got to bake this raw dough on the side of the road. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? That's like not even realistic to think that they waited to bake this. So they were doing this all day long on the day of the 14th, which is called the preparation. They were preparing their dough before it had risen, before it had leavened, and they baked it beforehand so that they would have something to eat on the road. Yeah, they basically made emergency provisions to go. Right. They didn't bring extra water for baking. They didn't bring <laughs> extra wood for baking and starting fires along the way. Right. And there weren't a ton of... While it was the desert, it's not like there's suitable smooth rocks that you can just cook from the, the heat of the sun <laughs> on some rock. Yeah, and they left at night. So, and they had to follow the pillar of fire, so they would have kept on moving because they made it to the Red Sea in three days. Can you imagine if they had all stopped at the side of the road to bake some cakes? No way. They had to keep on moving to make it in three days to the Red Sea. Okay, so it says they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. Neither had they prepared, prepared for themselves any victual. What that means is they hadn't prepared any food for themselves prior to being cast out of Egypt by Pharaoh. Up until this point, they didn't know they were getting kicked out of Egypt. Yahuwah knew. All of a sudden, Pharaoh says, get out. So now they got to hurry up and scramble and, you know, they would make their dough before bed. They would go to bed at night and while they were sleeping... Their dough would would ferment and, and leaven in a normal normal circumstance. Right, but now all of a sudden they're like, oh, oh, we gotta we gotta bake this now. We can't even wait for it to to rise. We can't even wait for the dough to rise. We gotta hurry up and bake this. And let's remember that the lamb and the entire meal, they said, finish it up. Don't let any any of it be left. Right. So I I also don't think, not just the lamb, but. There was to be none of the meal left at all. Right. Exactly. So they didn't have bread rising overnight. <laughs> right. Exactly. So in Exodus twelve forty two, it says, It is a night to be much observed unto Yahuwah for bringing them out of the land of Mitzrayim. And he says, This is that night of Yahuwah to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And then, of course, I already read this to you, Deuteronomy 16, 1, observe the month of Abib and keep the Pesach unto Yahuwah, your Elohim, for in the month of Abib, Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought you forth out of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, by night. Numbers 33, 3 says, and I think this is interesting because our Messiah was 33 years old when they killed him, and... He was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So I think that's interesting that Numbers 33, 3, and they departed from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. So I, I find it interesting. Some people try to say that the word tomorrow, because that's the English word tomorrow, means the next morning. But when you look up this word morrow uh, in Hebrew, let's look at that. Number 33, 3. Um, number 33, morrow is um, from out of, okay? And then because the, it's two words, and uh, mokorat means the morrow tomorrow next day so in other words here's the point i'm making as soon as the sun went down on the 14th of abib it became the 15th day okay now just because you see the word day doesn't mean it was daylight hours because you when you look up this word day let's look up the word day in hebrew so people people get so confused about the word day 31 uh, 17 yom it says, from an unused root, meaning to be hot a day as the warm hours, whether literally from sunrise to sunset or from one sunset to the next, 
or figuratively, a space of time defined by an associated term, often used to mean like an age. Okay, so the word day can be referring to the 12 hour period of daylight, but it can also be referring to from one sunset to the next, meaning the 24 hour calendar date. Okay, but can also mean an age. Okay, like, like in Yahuwah's day or in Moses' day, that would be an age. Right. It also means evening. See, if you look at that word, it can also mean evening. So it's people see day and they automatically think, oh, that's just talking about daylight. No, 15th calendar date. There's no word in Hebrew for calendar date. It doesn't exist. The word day, yom, can mean either the 12-hour period of daylight or it can mean the 24-hour date, calendar date. So they left on the 15th day, calendar date of the first month on the morrow after the Passover. And because they left at night, that tells us that all that day on the 14th, they were preparing to leave. It was preparation day. The sun's going down and they're leaving on the 15th. Bake the unleavened bread, pack the cart. Borrow and plunder from the Egyptians who are very eager for them to leave. Right. The mixed multitude who was like, I'm going with these guys. Yes. Are, are getting ready to. Right. The gospel Passover. Messiah's body was metaphorically, metaphorically became like the ashes of the red heifer baked in the fire. Now, I'm not saying that they actually burned his body in the fire. What I'm saying is metaphorically speaking. Because why? His spirit departed, right? It says they departed in the first month on the 15th day. So that this means when the sun went down on the 14th, they left at night. Same thing happened here. Our Messiah's body was metaphorically became like the ashes of the heifer baked in the fire when his spirit departed. And where did he go? Into the heart of the earth. Before he was risen from the dead. In the same way that they baked their dough before it had risen, before it had leavened, before he had risen from the dead, he went where? To the heart of the earth, the lower parts of the earth. Now, some people like these word of faith teachers will lie and say that he went to hell. So I'm giving this disclaimer. There are many of word of faith preachers on television, such as Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Myers, Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar. They all teach that our Messiah had to suffer in hell as a sinner. That is a blasphemous lie. That is not what I'm suggesting here. When Paul talks about Messiah descending into the lowest parts of the earth, he went there to do Two different things, and and I'll explain. So, in keeping with the pattern of the red heifer ordinance in Numbers 19, our Messiah's body became like the ashes of the red heifer as he went into the lower parts of the earth. In other words, that was Abraham's bosom, which our Messiah told about in Luke 16, 19 through 31. What was the purpose of him going there? Scripture tells us he went there to preach the good news to all those righteous souls who had died prior to his crucifixion. It tells us in 1 Peter 3.19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, it doesn't tell us. If that means he was preaching to the demonic principalities down there, or if it means he was preaching to, you know, you have to understand Sheol, which is the Hebrew word for hell, is in the center of the earth. And it was divided up into two different, uh, two different uh, areas. areas, right? So one half of the area was called Abraham's bosom. The other place was this place of torment where the rich man was in flames and there was a great chasm. It tells us this in Luke 16. There was a great gulf fixed between 
Abraham's bosom and the rich man. And he, the rich man shouted across the chasm to Abraham and said, please send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and, you know, put some water on to cool my tongue, you know, and, and Abraham says, no, it's not possible. There's a great chasm or a gulf fixed between us. Okay. So Sheol was divided into two sections. You had the section where the righteous souls were at called Abraham's bosom. And then you had Sheol, which the other half, which is the place of torment. Okay. So, um, it says that he went to preach the good news to all those quote unquote old Testament saints. I just use the word old Testament saints for lack of a better term. Okay. I know, you know, we, we all cringe. Those of us in Hebrew roots or Netzarim, we cringe at the word old Testament, but just for sake, for the sake of making myself clear, all those who died prior to his crucifixion, that's, that's where they went when they died. They went to this place of, uh, called Abraham's bosom. Okay. And it tells us he went to preach to those spirits in prison. And then it says in chapter, uh, in, it says that he gave gift, the gifts of salvation. He gave gifts unto men. So he gave the gift of salvation to those same quote unquote Old Testament saints by bringing them to the throne in heaven as his first fruits wave sheaf offering. Now, how do we know he brought them before the throne? Okay, um, because we are told in Leviticus 23, 9 through 14, the high priest in the temple was supposed to wave that first fruits barley before the father in heaven. Okay, and, and in Romans 8, 23, and also 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, James 1, 18, Revelation 14, 4, those of us who are born again by the blood of the lamb, we are called his first fruits. Okay. And it tells us in Ephesians, he, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth, but then he ascended that he might fulfill all things. Okay. The third thing he did was he took away the keys of death and hell from Satan. It tells us that's in, tells us this in revelation one eighteen. Okay. And I have this other blog called He Led Captivity Captive and Gave Gifts Unto Men. And I recommend that blog. It um, really goes into a lot of detail about where we go, where all righteous souls go when they die. Okay. Because a lot of people out there teaching soul sleep, but that is not a biblical doctrine. That comes from the Seventh-day Adventists. And, and I debunked that whole theory in this blog. Abraham's bosom, as I've already said, was divided into two sections. Each was divided by a great chasm, Luke 16, 26. In the story of Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man was being tormented in flames in Sheol, which is Hades or hell. Now, some people say, oh, Sheol just means the grave. It's not talking about a personal grave. The word grave means this subterranean grave in the heart of the earth, like this huge giant grave for billions of souls. Okay. So Lazarus was being comforted in the bosom of Abraham. And you see the artist depiction. You got the rich man engulfed in flames. There's a great chasm between them. And, you know, Lazarus is covering his face because I guess the smell of rotting flesh. I mean, that's, you know, that's how the artist depicted it. It's just trying to make a point. Actually, if you look carefully, I think he's drinking out of a cup. Oh, you know what? You're right. <laughs> That's funny. This whole time, <laughs> I was thinking he was covering his mouth because it was so, you know, the smell was, the stench was so bad. But now that you say that, <laughs> that's true. That's a cup. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> you bet. This whole time I was looking at this the wrong way. That's hilarious. 
<laughs> yeah, so you can see this water, this water brooks, you know, it's like, it's almost like showing us that, you know, he's in a place of comfort. He's being embraced by Abraham. He's drinking, you know, he's beside the, the, the brook, you know, so it, <laughs> that's hilarious. Okay, so Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man's engulfed in flames. And here you've got the priests burning the ashes of the heifer. My point is we're seeing a metaphor here that our Messiah was portraying the role of the red heifer. Now, he didn't literally get burned per se, right? He didn't literally go to hell and suffer there as a sinner. But it's just that it's it's a metaphor. That's all it is. Okay. Through his descent into the heart of the earth, Matthew 12, 40 and Ephesians 4, 8 through 9, our Messiah took away the keys to death and hell. That's Revelation 1, 18. Okay. The Exodus Passover, the Egyptians buried their dead just before sundown on the 14th of Abib. And then the date changed to the 15th of Abib, which is when, which then became the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On the 14th of Abib before sundown, this is when the Egyptians buried their dead. In Numbers 33, 3 through 4, we are told that uh, right here in Numbers, uh, it says, And they departed from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month on the morrow after the Passover. The morrow just means a new calendar date. It doesn't mean it has to be daylight. Like a lot of people say, oh, tomorrow, that means the next morning. Not necessarily. The morrow just means the next calendar date. If I'm talking to somebody at 12.30 a.m. and I say today's payday, I don't mean today like another calendar date. I mean, it's I'm already in that calendar date. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's light or dark. Right. So on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. And then it says in verse four, for the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which Yahuwah had smitten among them upon their gods, you know, and I just I use the word gods when it comes to pagan deities. But when it comes to Yahuwah, I never use the word G.O.D. in the capital form. G.O.D. is not a proper name. And actually, the word God, G.O.D., means Baal God. You know, Baal, there's actually a pagan deity named Baal God. He's the God of fortune, the fortune deity. So I never use the word God, capital G.O.D., for our creator. I use Elohim. But when, when I'm talking about pagan gods, I don't mind saying the word gods. Elohim is is what that word gods means. But um, wh I don't use it when referring to pagan gods because if I say Elohim, people get confused and they think I'm talking about the one true Elohim. So to make a distinction, I use the word gods when it comes to pagan deities. Okay. So they buried their dead. Just before the, it says for the Egyptians buried all their firstborn. So they had just started burying their dead when the, when they left Egypt on the 15th. Okay. Same exact timing here. Okay. Our Messiah's dead body was buried in the tomb before sundown on the 14th of Abib. And then the date changed to the 15th of Abib which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And here it tells us in Yehuchanan or John 19, 31, the Yahudim, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, the preparation would mean it was the 14th day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath day was a high day besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and on uh, and that they might be taken away. So in other words, they had to bury him before the sun went down because as soon as the sun went down, the date changed. It became the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it says that the body should not remain on the cross 
on the Sabbath day. Now, to those who would argue and say that, you know, that the calendar day begins in the morning, let me show you why, okay? Uh, I have another blog called The Sabbath Was Made for Man. Okay, and in here, I show an Old Testament, you know, quote-unquote Tanakh, passage that gives credence to the fact that our they didn't leave the bodies on the cross okay they didn't leave the bodies on the cross all night long let me show this to you okay um so in the book of judges samson tells a riddle and this riddle was obviously a prophetic picture of messiah okay because he says in Judges 14, 18, and the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down. Okay. See, our Messiah resurrected on the seventh day of the week. Okay. Because he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the master of the Sabbath. So on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And then he said, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you had not found out my riddle. So there's this whole passage is just loaded with prophetic pictures here. Okay, Samson's name, Shimshon, his name literally means the light of the sun, the rays of the sun. Our Messiah is called the son of righteousness who arises with healing in his wings. He resurrected when? On the seventh day of the week before the sun went down. In other words, what we would today call Saturday evening. And, you know, Yahushua was called the lion of the tribe of Yehuda, Judah. And his word is as sweet as honey. His, light, his word is likened unto honey. Okay. And the heifer. Okay, we talked about the ashes of the heifer. Well, of course, in this passage, the heifer is referring to Samson's wife. If you had not plowed with my heifer, and I looked up the word plowed, it doesn't mean what people think. It's not sexual. It's just talking about, a, you know, he inter they interrogated her until she gave up the information. Okay. Um, also, there's another passage that gives credence to this. Right. And um, let's see. In Judges 14, 14, he gives them the riddle and he says, out of the eater, meaning the lion, came forth meat. In other words, the meat of the word and out of the strong came forth sweetness, which is honey. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. Well, we know our Messiah was in the heart of the earth three days before he resurrected on the seventh day. And then it tells us in Judges 14, 15, and it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, you know, Samson's wife is symbolic of Jerusalem. They said, entice your husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn you in your father's house with fire. So the harassment and the threatening is the definition of plowing with the heifer. Right. right. It's not talking about sex. They threatened her and her family. Right. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> then in Judges 14, 17, and she, Samson's bride, who represents Jerusalem, wept before him for seven days while their feast lasted. So how long is Passover week? Seven days, right? And it came to pass on the seventh day, which is Shabbat, that he told her because she lay sore upon him and she told the riddle uh, to the children of her people. In Judges 14, 18, it says, And the men of the city said unto him, on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? Okay. So right there, we have a prophetic picture of our Messiah resurrecting on the seventh day of the week before the sun went down. Okay. Now we see the same thing in the book of Joshua. Okay, let me find it here. It's uh, 
I think it's um, trying to try to find it. It's in the book of Joshua. Um, I know it's in here right somewhere. Give me a give me a minute to find it. So in the book of Joshua, it talks about the seventh day that they would not leave the bodies upon the cross or on the. Okay, let me find it here. Um, they would not leave the bodies all night long. Um, let's see. Maybe I didn't put it in this blog. I thought I I thought I shared that piece in this blog, but maybe I didn't. So, um, let's see. I uh, well, anyway, I I don't want to I don't want to take too much time, but I know that there is a passage where it talks about this in the book of Joshua that um the bodies should not remain um bodies not remain um so they um crucified uh, okay no that's not what i wanted um let me see i i can't remember where it is it's somewhere in the book of joshua but it talks about how they didn't allow the bodies to remain oh i know i know what it is let me find it here when it talks about um, cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. Cursed. Uh, Joshua twenty four thirty two. Uh, hangeth, hangeth, tree. Okay. Okay. Um, hang tree. Okay, here it is. Um, okay, in Joshua, it says, yeah, in Joshua 8, 29, it says, um, and that he, and the king of Ai, you know, Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening, and as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the entering of the gate of the city and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remains unto this day. Okay, so uh, they didn't allow the bodies to remain hung on the tree, they had to take it down before sundown because that's what the Torah commands. And even the Apostle Paul says this in Galatians. He says, Messiah has redeemed us from the curse of, you know, it says curse of the law. Christians think that means that the law of Moses is a curse. That's not what he means. He means the curse of breaking the law. In other words, the curses that are outlined in Deuteronomy 28, right? He has redeemed us from the curse of the Torah being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Okay, so cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Um, so we are told that um, in scripture that the bodies should not remain when, when they hang them on the tree, their bodies shall not remain all night, but they shall be buried the same day that they are killed. So our Messiah had to be buried the same day that he was killed. He didn't get buried the next morning, but I've heard some people argue that the people that say that. You know, a calendar date changes in the morning. They'll say, oh, his body was left there all night long. That goes against the Torah. His body could not remain all night long. Okay, according to the Torah, the body has to be buried the same day that that they are killed. Okay? It's kind of the same same sort of thing. It's considered defiling the land. Right. I don't know that it's... To the degree of having an innocent life, you know, someone murdered and found in the open country, but it's still an abomination. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
at the moment, I wish I had known where I put it in that blog because I thought I put it in the blog, but I guess I'm going to have to go and add that to the blog because I was pretty sure I added it there. So on the evening of the 14th of Abib, before sundown on the 15th of Abib, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took down Yahushua's body from the cross and then buried him in the tomb. So what we have here is an artist's depiction of the Egyptians mourning their dead and burying them. And here we've got Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus um, burying our Messiah. And it says that he was buried in a brand new tomb that Joseph of Arimathea donated. And it was a, a, a brand new tomb that no dead body had ever been laid in. Well, it tells us in Numbers 19 that the ashes of the heifer were to be collected into a brand new container that had never been used before. In other words, a clean place. It says the ashes had to be collected into a clean place or a clean container. Well, our Messiah's body was like the ashes of the heifer and put in a clean tomb, a clean place that had never been used. Okay. So he symbolizes the ashes of the heifer. Okay. The Exodus Passover, the Egyptians gave gifts to Israel, the firstborn or the first fruits of the redeemed. Um, after the sun went down, the 14th on the 14th of Abib, it became the 15th of Abib. It became the feast of unleavened bread. The Egyptians had already given gifts to the Israelites before they departed out of Egypt on that night to be much observed. I give all the citations here. And Exodus 12, 35 says, And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold. That's gifts. So the Egyptians gave them gifts. Okay. Exodus 12, 36 and Yahuwah gave the people favor, okay? Favor is the same word as grace. You know, in the New Testament, we see the word grace all the time. Grace is the same thing as favor. You could probably also uh, swap out the word gifts for bribes. <laughs> the, the Israelites, or I'm sorry, the Egyptians were trying to bribe them. Please go. Here, take this. Please go. Yeah. And Yahuwah gave the people favor or gifts in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. Now this word lent is not the, it doesn't mean they just lent it, you know, they let them borrow it. You know, we see the word borrow. We think that means they went and paid them back later. No, it just mean it's just the, you know, the English translators use that word but it's not like they went back later and gave gave it back to them. Okay. So the gospel Passover, Messiah gave gifts to who? The first fruits of his redeemed. So following the pattern of the first Passover in Egypt, our Messiah's spirit departed into the lower parts of the earth. Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Wherefore he said when he ascended up on high... So he went before the father and it says he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Okay. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Ephesians 4 10 says he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So what this means is, um, first he went, it says he had descended first into the lower parts of the earth before he ascended to the father. So that means he went to the lower parts of the earth and he says he was going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, right? So during those three days and three nights that his body was in the tomb, his spirit was down there in Abraham's bosom preaching the gospel. Then what? When Mary, when Mary Magdalene came to the tomb on Sunday morning, you know, we call it Sunday morning, but it was the first day of the week in the morning. He had already, his, he was already gone. She, she's having a conversation with whom she thinks is the gardener. And then she finally realized it's the Messiah himself. 
He says, do not touch me because I have not ascended yet to my father. But later on, he lets Thomas put his finger in his side. He lets Thomas touch him. Why? Because sometime in that period, from the time he appears to Mary in the garden, and then later when he appears to his disciples, sometime in that period, he had gone to the Father in heaven. And what did he do? He presented those first fruits of souls that he brought with him from Abraham's bosom. He brought them to the Father in heaven. So he ascended. And what did he do? Gave gifts to men. Salvation. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens. Why? There's three heavens described in scripture. Paul called one of them the third heaven. Okay. The third heaven is also called paradise. Paradise. Let's look at that word paradise because I want to show you this. Paradise. Okay. So, <clears throat> it's in three places. Remember the thief on the cross. Yahushua said to him, Verily I say to you, today shall you be with me in paradise. Okay? In 2 Corinthians 12, 4, Paul is speaking about some guy he knew that was caught up to the third heaven. Some commentators believe Paul's talking about himself. <clears throat> Doesn't really matter. He said he was caught up to the third heaven. It tells us this in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. He says, um, I, knew, I knew a man in Messiah about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. Elohim knows such a one caught up to the third heaven. Okay, but then in the... Chap in verse four, he says he was caught up to paradise. So now we know paradise is the same thing as the third heaven. Okay. The third heaven is at the throne. Okay. The first heaven is the atmosphere between earth and, you know, where we see airplanes and birds flying. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is what we call the expanse or the firmament. The expanse, I know flat earthers will say it's just this tiny little area. No, it's it's what we call outer space. It's like, the universe. Yeah. Um, okay. So then in Revelation 2, 7, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit or the Ruach says to the assemblies, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Elohim. So when the new Jerusalem comes down, the new heaven and the new earth, which is in the eighth millennium, okay, after the thousand year reign of Messiah is finished, then we're going to have paradise here on earth. So paradise at this moment in time is in the third heaven. It's at the throne. Okay, it's at the throne. In case anyone doubts where the thief on the cross went, okay, Yahushua brought them before the, brought all those souls that were in Abraham's bosom. It says he ascended far above all heavens, meaning above the first heaven, above the second heaven, where? To the third heaven, which is paradise. Okay. Explanation. He descended into Abraham's bosom and preached good news to the righteous souls, bringing them before the throne in heaven as his first fruits wave sheaf offering. Okay. So it would appear, I mean, you know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the toolbox, right? But it would appear that after Messiah's death and then resurrection, and then his ascension, let's all be clear, he's already ra raised, so it's post-crucifixion. -crucif he kept the feast of first fruits. Yes. And then with what he described would happen at Pentecost, he kept the feast of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. So he, he continued to use those patterns and to follow those patterns himself and to have his believers follow those patterns that were established from the beginning of all things. Right. For his purposes. Mm -hmm. 
So are you saying, I want to make sure I understand this. Are you saying <laughs> that we shouldn't dispense with Yahuwah's feasts? Yeah, of course. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Among course. other things? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure I got that. <laughs> All right, so we're done, and I would love to hear from you guys. I would love to hear your thoughts, your questions, your comments, whatever you um, want to talk about. I mean, I would, of course, prefer to, we stick to this topic, but once we've covered this topic, if there's anything else, we can, you know, we can move on to the next the next teaching. Which is scheduled to be at 3.05 Pacific, which is approximately 25 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's take... Uh, Q&A, make it yeah. rapid fire if we can, <laughs> yeah. relatively speaking. So in Zoom, you guys can uh, now unmute yourselves. And if you have any questions in chat, go ahead and type that in. Now, Dan, you're usually a chatterbox, um, but <laughs> that, that's a joke, inside joke. Yeah. That's Scott. Okay, I've got a question. Um, so... Messiah descended for three days and everything. And then I know scripture says that basically many of the saints were seen in at that time and everything. Yep. So basically, yeah, he has not ascended to the father yet. So he hasn't presented the first fruits. So is there anything in scripture that it talks about what happens to those that died during that time? Died during what time? The time that he, between the time that he, he kind of like reascended back up and they're all seen in Jerusalem because he hasn't presented yet. So, or was just death suspended for that time? I'm just curious. So I think if I can paraphrase this, Scott, it, so basically between his, his crucifixion and his, his offering up to the first fruits uh, from the grave, if you will, um, what happened to anyone who died in those three days? around the world, right? Correct, yes. So, okay, the earthquake, it tells us right here. Um, let me see, let me find it here. That's an interesting question, uh, yeah. by the way. Okay, so it says, Yahushua, when he cried again with a loud voice. Let me uh, change this from... Um, <clears throat> okay, it says... Trying to go right here. Cried with a loud voice, yielded up the his spirit. You know, I don't like the King James word, the ghost. Um, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. In other words, it was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. In other words, even the rocks broke. Um, yeah. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. I'm going to go right here, here. Um, I turned it, I changed it to KJV plus so we could hover over the words. Okay. Um, and it says, uh, where were we here? I switched to KJV plus. Um, yeah. Um, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose. I explain what this word slept is talking about, because to put it in a nutshell, when someone's dead, they look like they're sleeping. Sure. But those who are in Messiah when they die, it's only a temporary condition. He knows we're not going to stay dead. Because he says, whoever believes on me shall never die. He says, we shall never taste death. Now, of course, we're going to taste physical death. But when he says that we shall never taste death, he's talking about spiritual death, right? Yes, it's, it, that would be the same death that was talked about in the garden on the day that you eat this, surely you will die. Right. He was talking about spiritual death. Right, because in, in Revelation chapter 20, okay, it talks about two different, it talks about the first resurrection, and then it talks about... The the last it talks about the let me see let me find it here it just kind of escapes me at the moment how it's worded but it's in Revelation it talks about um uh let's see 
but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection is for the righteous. And then he says, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. So the second death, there's, there's the physical death to the body, which everybody experiences. But then the second death that he's talking about is spiritual death. Okay, so when he told Adam and Eve that in the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. They didn't die. They didn't drop dead. They stayed alive physically. He was talking about spiritual death, spiritual death. They died spiritually. They experienced a separation from him. Okay, and so something had to die to take place of, for their sin. That's why he killed a lamb and covered them with animal skins. He made atonement for Adam and Eve. So. My point in saying that is that, um, you know, in John, where were we? We were in Matthew 7, 27, Matthew 27, when it says to those that slept, that many that slept, um, let me see, I'm trying to find the place where it says he cried with a loud voice and then. Uh, yeah, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. So, yeah, there was people that came out of their graves. It says and, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So this is talking about after his resurrection, which was three days later. OK, but it's but it's the earthly city. Right? Yeah. So he went. So many of those people. They didn't get incorruptible bodies. They gay they were given, you know, their mortal bodies again. And I believe they lived out their the rest of their days until it was time to die, right? So maybe those were the people that that had died from the time that after he already went like after his death and he already went down? I don't know. Because the question Scott was asking is more more to broadly speaking worldwide after he's already gone down to, you know, give gifts unto men in the right. grave, mm -hmm. what happens to those who join the grave like they're late? Like he was already there and he was, uh, you know, he's getting ready to ascend and take up the first fruits and then they died, okay. you know, right before, you know, that. So to answer that question, let me show you this blog right here that I wrote called, um, try to find it. Yeah. Okay. So I've got this other blog called he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and in this blog i explain what happens when we die pre-crucifixion all the saints old testament saints if you will i'm just using that for lack of a better term um, all those who died before crucifixion of messiah they went to abraham's bosom but prior i mean after his crucifixion it says we go to we go straight to heaven. That's why Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with Yahuwah. He says, um, wherefore we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with Yahuwah. Uh, well, for he first starts in 2 Corinthians 5, 6. He says, therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from Yahuwah. Okay. And then in verse 8, he goes, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with Yahuwah. And then in, in Revelation 6, 9, it talks about the souls of them that were slain for the word of Elohim. And it says they cried with a loud voice. How long, O Yahuwah, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So there, there's these souls under the altar with palm branches. And they're asking to be avenged for their, you know, being martyred. They were martyred. And, and, they, and they're told that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were shall be fulfilled. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to avenge the blood of all the martyrs at once at the same time. So you guys just wait. 
because when Messiah comes back, he's going to avenge the blood of the saints. It tells us this in Revelation 19, 3, that he avenges the blood of the servants. So they have to wait until everyone has been martyred, and then he avenges everybody's blood at once. So as soon as we die in Messiah, this is post-crucifixion, our spirit goes to heaven, our body remains in the grave and we're decaying our bodies decaying in the grave but our spirit is absent from the body and we're present with yahuwah and then we are told in in ezekiel 37 that something is going to happen on that that day it's a one-time event in history where all these dry bones are going to come out of their graves and it says and he says that he's going to give us new flesh and new skin and he's going to breathe. He tells tells Ezekiel to breathe, you know, prophesy over these bones. And he says, and I will lay sinews upon you and I will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. So this is describing that one time in history where all righteous souls are going to get a new incorruptible body. Right. But in the meantime, in the interim, in 1 Corinthians um, 15, Paul actually tells us there's a natural body and he says there's a spiritual body. And he says, so in other words, when we die, we go to heaven in this spiritual body. In other words, it's like our natural bodies in the grave decaying. But we have this spiritual body that houses our soul and our spirit. But when we get resurrected and we come out of that grave, our spirit and our soul is going to be joined back to our natural body. And our natural body is going to become incorruptible. Okay. That's why it says it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And then he says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because I interviewed a guy one time who had a clinical death experience named Howard Pittman. And he explained that he had a heart attack. And as his spirit was leaving his body, he could see his body down on the bed. He's leaving his body. He was escorted to heaven by an angel. And he had a conversation with the father at the throne. And he's explaining to the father all the good things he did. And the father's basically telling him your life has been an abomination to me. It's not what he was hoping to hear. He was a minister, a Baptist minister, and he was a police officer and he was considered a pillar in the community. But what it, what, what he, what he meant when he said everything you've done, he says, you've done it for selfish purposes. In other words, he worked 60 hours a week. He was so busy, busy, busy all the time trying to do good deeds and good works. But he didn't make time for prayer. He didn't make time. He wasn't doing the good works because he had this intimacy with the father. He was just so busy, busying himself all the time, trying to make himself look good in front of people. But there was that lack of intimacy with the father. He wasn't a man of prayer. It was, I mean, you know, probably said a quick little prayer at night. Now I lay me down to sleep or whatever. But he was basically told by the father, I'm sending you back. You're going to go back. And, and this time you're going to tell people I'm coming soon, you know, and that's what happened. He, he got sent back and, and, uh, you know, he was, he basically, now he keeps the feasts and he keep, you know, he started obeying what the scripture teaches. But my point is he saw his body. He went up to heaven, um, in a spiritual body. So he still had a body that resembled the natural body, but it was a spiritual body. Meanwhile, his natural body was, was laid to rest in a grave. Okay. But eventually all of us are going to come out of our graves and we're going to be joined to this incorruptible body that's never going to die, that's never going to decay. So I hope that answers. You, you know, if I may add something real quick. Sure. Um, I've been telling people for a long time now that hell is full of good people and they get offended. 
And this is a great story that you just told about this ex-cop pastor guy. Yeah. Because people think that hell is like mostly with people like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer. But I, <laughs> right. I don't believe that. I believe that hell is filled mostly with people like your next door neighbor. Yeah, I know. Who are just in shock that they're there. Mm hmm. You know, say so I'm a good person. You know, I did right. this, I did that. I mean, so anyway, I just wanted to add that. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but Howard Pittman was taken heaven, even though he wasn't living. The only reason he was taken heaven is because he did have some semblance of faith, faith in the Father. But Amen. He, but he was like, you know, you think that your life that you've done all this good stuff for me. He's like, no, you, 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 you know, you've, he said, your life's been like an abomination to me. So that's not what he was hoping to hear. <laughs> but now that he Amen. was, now that he was, now that he was warned, now I'm sure next time he goes, dies and goes to heaven, he's going to um, hopefully get things right. <laughs> and, and, you know, I remember once too, like uh, being in church back in Jersey, like mm -hmm. when I first got saved over well over 25 years ago. Um, I remember this pastor pre preached the message. He was from California. It was some African-American gentleman. I don't even remember his name. But he said that he was at this pastor's conference once and they were handing out awards like left and right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then his name got called and he went up there to get his award. And the moment that he put his foot like on the first step, because there were steps to get to the stage, you know, Yahuwah was like, you may be right with men, but you're not right with me. Mm -hmm. Ouch. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so he went up there to get that award, and he just fell off. He didn't say that. He couldn't say nothing, you know. But um, but anyway. Yeah. That along with, you know, so many scriptures in the Bible that talks about this, you know, all right. our righteousness is like filthy rags. That's right. You know? That's right. So. Yeah, I know. I think about that a lot. I'm like, Father, I know. I mean, I'm trying to do the work of the kingdom, but there's always that nagging feeling that it's not about what you do to be seen by men it's what you do when you're not being seen by men like when in when in your private time how like how do you conduct yourself do you pray do you spend time with him you know that's really what counts it, yeah yes absolutely um and yahushua talked about that too but you know this reminds me of that scripture too in jeremiah where it says the heart is deceitful above all things that's right Absolutely. it says above all things there's nothing more deceitful than the heart that's what that means there's it's none good no things. not one yeah. all have and sinned desperately wicked <laughs> yes. not not just wicked desperately that's wicked. right we wicked. all we deceive we deceive who? ourselves we deceive ourselves that's, that's that's where i'm going and mm -hmm. who, and then he says who can know it yeah and he says i yahuwah search the heart Mm -hmm. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his wow to his, to his ways and and according to the fruit of his doings. All we can do is be broken and humble before him, because really, in our own strength, none of us would make it. None of us. And, and you know, you have to constantly be examining yourself mm -hmm. and judging yourself, and be like, "Why did I do that? Did I do that with the right heart?" You know. Yep. Exactly. Was, was I doing that to be seen of men? Yeah. To appear pious or holy or, you know, so you have to constantly be examining your heart. Absolutely, you know? brother. And, and yep. like you say, like you just said, uh, have a broken and contrite spirit and, and be working with the with the Holy Spirit. Say, like, Lord, you know, you know, my heart. That's right. You know, let me let me take a few more questions before we got to move on to the next teaching. Um, but if you stick around, uh, Malcolm, you know, we'll we'll get to chat more. Um, uh, just real quick, too, uh, before we go further, we're supposed to start in seven minutes on a new stream. I can move that time a little bit. But um, when we do that, so on the YouTube channel, if you click on the live stream tab on our YouTube page, you will see that there's another one coming up. And so when we finally end this stream, we do it just because it makes it easier to have the videos broken up and they're already 
you know, separated. Right. So that's why we'll be starting another stream when we do it. So that's where it'll be. Yeah. In seven minutes, you're going to be disconnected from this stream and you're going to have to log back in again and go to the yeah. live tab. Yeah. We have to log in, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, I'll, um, I'll push it off if uh, by a few minutes, but, um, anyway, so real quick. Um, so we have a chat. So, uh, a gentleman named, um, Monk E mm -hmm. uh, in the chat asked about, you know, working on the Sabbath, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, like if you're a firefighter or a police officer, mm -hmm. um, and I responded and I'll say this, this is my personal disclaimer. You know, mm -hmm. I've been walking Torah since, uh, like 2007 mm -hmm. and I'm nowhere near perfect at it. Uh, in fact, I feel like an infant in many ways. Um, yet in my experience in fellowship, uh, whatnot, um, I would feel comfortable saying that fire, police, military, um, emergency critical care workers, doctors, nurses, um, lab people that are all doing emergent sort of testing or emergent care mm -hmm. for those who are critically ill or military life-saving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. You know, someone's got to man the tower, if you will, to, for war, just because you, you might not be actively saving a life at that moment. You, you can't, you can't have people in the tower watching for the enemy if you're not making a living for them. Right. So the only thing that was, they're still drawing a paycheck. It's just that hopefully they're not collecting the paycheck on the Sabbath. Maybe they're on salary. They don't collect their paycheck until one of the days of the week or something. You know what I mean? I don't know. If you're an office worker and you, you know, and this goes for all these things. If you're an office worker and it's elective work that you don't have to work that day, it's just that that department or that that job you do, they like to run 24 seven and it's not truly like life saving, um, care, then that's something that you really need to seek out in prayer because mm -hmm. I would say that's, I used to be a car mechanic, right? Yeah. And I wouldn't work on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Although initially I had to work on Shabbat because I was the mechanic in that shop before I came into Sabbath. Right. And I was praying and praying, father, you know, help you know, I can't afford to leave my family stranded now that I'm in Shabbat and I'm married and I have kids now um, and I have this job. How do I get out of this? How do I? Right. Do I do I just leave my job? That seems ir irresponsible. Right. right. Um, but I don't want to be there. And I prayed about it and it turned out that. Um, that I had seniority over somebody else who didn't care. And so the, un the, the union took another look and said, no, you have seniority that person does not. And so, you know, I said, Hey, sorry, nothing against you, but this is about my, my Sabbath. And so they, they flipped us and he got my schedule and I got his. Uh, that's awesome. Hallelujah. You you know? Well, my testimony is that when I was starting to pray about keeping Shabbat, I was working at a call center for Intuit and, you know, into it's like a software company and I was doing sales, you know, had to take inbound sales, inbound calls and sell products. Right. Well, they required that you work one Sabbath a month. And at even at the interview, I told them I don't work on Sabbath. But then all of a sudden they tried to tell me, oh, you have to work one Sabbath a month. I said, but I already explained at the interview, I don't that I keep the Sabbath, you know. And so, but they were still pressuring me that I had to work the Sabbath. Well, I was like, Father, what do I do? I can't afford to lose my job. So then something happened and I ended up getting fired. It was like a long story, but they accused me of uh, working unauthorized overtime. Like if I took a call five minutes before it was time to clock out and the call turned into like a huge sale... And it like a lot of times that would happen. I'd get a phone call like five minutes or 10 minutes before it's time to clock out. And it turned into this like huge sale where I sold like a ton of products. You would have thought they would have been happy about that, right? I just made them a boatload of money. So that forced me to have to go 30 minutes beyond when I was supposed to be clocking out. They said, oh, you're working unauthorized overtime. Okay. And other people were doing it, and they didn't get fired for it, but I got fired for it, right? But there was another reason. It was because everybody was keeping Christmas except for me, and I had a menorah on my, you know, on my uh, desk and all this stuff. 
And everybody thought I was the oddball because I wouldn't participate in the secret Santa gift exchange. Okay. So I wouldn't participate in these things. So they had it out for me. And so they found an excuse to fire me. So during that time that I was fired, I, I went and applied for unemployment benefits and I got the unemployment benefits and I was able to live on those unemployment ben benefits for like four months until father during that time said, I don't want you working full time. I want you in the ministry full time. So I was like scared to death. I was like, how am I going to survive being in the ministry full time? And uh, my family thought I'd lost my mo mind. They're like, what are you going to live on? I'm like, take it up with the father, you know? And so he basically provided for me and I started, you know, praying with people over the phone. I started doing podcasts and then people started donating and somehow I made it. Somehow he provided and I made it. But that's how he took, that's how he got me out of the workplace and he got me to be able to put me in a place where I could keep Shabbat. Not the same thing that happened to Gary, but that's what he did with me. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, okay. And now, uh, SR. And so by the way, monkey said he's, you know, he just came into, you know, keeping Shabbat, uh, keeping Torah, uh, like six months ago. So, or something like that. So it's, it's cool for welcome to the family. And, uh, yeah, those are questions we all have to grapple with. Uh, when we come into the this understanding, um, so SR says uh, when he re when he returns, um, and there is a massive earthquake that that liquefies the land, making all the land level for the new Jerusalem. It, um, if all chaos, then how I will all see him technically um, be gone? I'm not, I'm not, I didn't do that justice. I'm not sure I understand. Um, so when, when he comes back and he liquefies everything and makes things smooth for the new Jerusalem, mm -hmm. how is everyone going to see him? I'm not sure. I, I think the sequence of events maybe in that statement are very compressed. Yeah. So, um, you have to understand that, um, the second coming is for the seventh millennium. Okay. In the seventh millennium, we, we have in, in revelation 20, uh, it says that when the thousand years are finished, you know, Satan is, is in the, um, is in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And it says when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Okay. In the previous verse, it says that we shall rule and reign with Messiah on earth for a thousand years. Right. So there's a thousand year reign, which is the seventh millennium. Then we go to the next chapter and it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So this is the eighth millennium. Okay. But during a thousand the, years from now, yeah, approximately just over a thousand years. You, from right. Now. So during the, so when he returns, he's going to cleanse the earth by fire, just like in the days of Noah, he cleansed the earth by water water baptism, but this time it's going to be fire baptism, just like at Pentecost, you know, we get water baptized when we're first born again as a sign of our salvation, but then we get fire baptized because fire sanctifies, you know, that last bit of unrighteousness, that right, that last bit of unholiness that's in us, you know, fire is cleanses things completely. Okay, he's going to baptize the whole earth with fire. So the earth is going to be cleansed, but it's not going to be an entirely new heaven or an entirely new earth until the eighth millennium. It's just going to be a cleansed earth, but not an entirely new heaven and a new earth until the eighth millennium. So when it says every eye shall see him, it doesn't necessarily say all at once. It just says Every, let me see, every I see, okay. Uh, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. Okay. Now it doesn't necessarily say everyone's going to see him at once, but it's implied. That's probably every eye is going to see him. Does that mean, and a lot of people that are flat earthers will say, oh, see, it has to be a flat earth. 
Well, if it's a flat, if the earth is flat and everybody can see him at once, that means he's going to have to be so humongous because obviously on a, on a flat earth model, we don't see the sun anymore when it goes down because the sun has vanished into the distance. So how are we supposed to see Messiah when he's only the size of a tiny little human being? How we, how's everybody on earth supposed to see him when he's just this, you know, the size of a human being? Yeah, I don't care how bright you are. I mean, if, <laughs> if, if, if you're glowing like magma and you're only six foot tall, I'm not going to see you if you're in Utah. Exactly. Right? And I'm in California, even if the earth is flat, let alone, you know, you want to talk about the West Coast to East Coast. Now you want to talk about the Middle East from what the West Coast. Right, right. So that reasoning is, we can reject that theory. Yeah, because, I mean, flat earthers claim the earth vanishes, uh, the sun vanishes away into the distance and we don't see it anymore, even though it's still supposed to be 3,000 miles above us. So how come we don't see the sun anymore and it's supposed to be much bigger than a human being? So I would just say, personally, that argument doesn't hold. But I would say that the reason why everybody shall see him is maybe we all have cell phones. Maybe it's because we see him on television. We see him on on flat screen right. TVs or, you right. know. No, SR does make a good point that, I mean, potentially... You know, again, this this only works for a flat Earth model. Potentially, he could be so radiant, so bright, like a gazillion suns, that he would blind everyone on Earth so they'd only see him. I'm, jo I'm joking. But they'd only see him for a split second. That even though they couldn't see this six-foot-tall man figure, that the brightness would be seen everywhere. But that only works if the Earth is flat. You believe in the globe Earth. And half of the earth is light and half of the earth is dark. And you can't see the light that's being blocked by the earth itself from the other side. Then it doesn't matter how bright he is. You're still not going to see it. I would, I would guess like you that because of all the satellite communications, all the cell phones, all the radios, all the newspapers that, I mean, that everyone's going to have some sort of live feed, even when things are crazy with war and catastrophes, and there's going to be a lot of infrastructure that's not going to be working quite right. Mm -hmm. I still believe that there's going to be enough going that no one's going to miss it. Right. And and you have to understand that the Bible oftentimes speaks in language that's real general. Like, let me give you an example. It tells us in Revelation 13 that the, that the beast deceives them that dwell on the earth. Okay. Now, obviously, it's not every single human being is deceived because there's obviously a remnant that are saved. But if you read this, you would think, oh, every single person's deceived. No, not every single person. It just says them that dwell on the earth. So it doesn't mean every single person. But then it says in, in um, Revelation 13, 16, 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So does that mean all, every single human being is going to take the mark of the beast? There's nobody that is saved? No, of course not. When it uses the word all, it's like a generality, like a large number of people in the world are going to take the mark. Obviously, there's going to be those who don't take it. You know what I mean? So when he says all, he doesn't mean literally all. He just means a big group of people. And so I would say that's the same thing here when it says, and every eye shall see him. Does that mean every eye or does it just, is it just means like in general, a lot of people are going to be able to see him at once. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's when you look at the word every, it's whole, you know, uh, like the whole world is going to see him. Right. I think it's going to be via, via electronics because even on a flat earth model, you still can't see him from a great distance. Even if it's, even if he's bright, all you're going to see is a light. You're not going to distinguish that it's a human being. Right. And so the chat's going wild with this, right? So <laughs> I appreciate everyone's uh, opinions, and I'm glad that we can all share without getting upset with one another. Um, so I don't think it's that Yahushua is too small. Like, I'm not—I don't 
think that I'm trying to limit him like he's not powerful enough. But one of the problems I've seen in in my walk is that people say Yuhua can do anything, right? Yeah. So and, and he and he can he can he, he can do just about anything. Right. But once he declares or once he declares something, he, he doesn't go back on his word. Right. So if he says, I am the author of truth and I'm faithful and I never lie, yep. which basically he does say that in his word, mm -hmm. then by the fact of him saying that he's boxed himself in. So he can't be the, the perfect picture of truth and honesty and reliability if he breaks his word. Mm -hmm. So while he's got the power to do anything, he's boxed himself in. So he can't just do anything that would disagree with what he's already stated. Mm -hmm. Having said that, if he's created the sun, the moon, and the stars and said they'll function up until I destroy everything and there's a new Jerusalem, mm -hmm. then up until there's a new Jerusalem, the sun, and the moon, and the stars have to stay in existence. That's right. So that means the laws of physics, the laws of gravity, the way the light works and bends, all has to be in place because that's how the solar system works. That's how we get our heat and our cold. That's how we have springtime and winter and crops. Mm -hmm. So if all that's still in place, then in my small brain, I have to assume, I don't know how he's going to do it exactly, mm -hmm. but I do know that if I'm standing on one side of the mountain, I can't see somebody with a spotlight shining through the mountain mm -hmm. because the mountain's in the way. So if you take the globe and I'm on the opposite side of the earth, and he comes down as radiant as he can. I don't know that I can see his physical radiance because it's got to shine through the rock of the earth. Mm -hmm. So if it's so bright that it glows and it's no longer nighttime at the night side, maybe that's how he's going to do it, but maybe not. And in terms of all electronics being gone, it doesn't say there's no electronics. Mm -hmm. All we know is that there's... Armageddon, and there's those coming against Jerusalem, and one third of Jerusalem will survive, and the other two thirds will be destroyed. And it's at the pinnacle of that that he comes down. So, are they shooting? It's before the battle of Armageddon even starts. I mean, it's like the battle starts when he comes down with his army, and we're going to be fighting against them in our in our you know, new bodies. You know, so, uh, Gary. Yeah. Oh, hey, MP. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Sorry. I had to jump in because um, yeah, this is uh, it's it's crazy that you guys are talking about this. But uh, a couple of years ago during COVID, I had a dream, right? And uh, in that dream, it was the craziest dream I ever had in my entire life. I was telling a coworker about this a couple of days ago, but I saw uh, Yahuwah coming down in the clouds with the army of angels, right? Mm-hmm. Actually, and, the, well, the army is really the bride, the saints. I mean, yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, and uh, as he was coming down, right, it was over. It was over America because I saw the colors of red, white, and blue, mm -hmm. and uh, there was hands raised up in the air, crying out, oh, you know, "Forgive me, forgive me." They were trying to repent. Oh, <laughs> but he was he was already coming down, right, and he was telling him it's too late it's too late mm. i'm already here i'm coming down mm. and you know i took that as the rapture mm -hmm. what i was seeing was the actual was the rapture um but yeah i mean i i saw this and i just remember telling my wife after mm. you know i had saw it was like the next day and uh it was just so real like you know, the amount of people that were trying to repent was just, it was a crazy number of people. It was a sea, mm -hmm. basically like a sea of people mm -hmm. that were trying to repent. And mm -hmm. it was just, it was just nuts. Wow. That's... But yeah, it was, it was, this was just a couple of years ago. And I was like, oh my, wow, this, this was the rapture. And I'm well, let me let me explain it. something, because a lot of people that are now saying there's not going to be any rapture at all, which I disagree. The The Latin word is rapturo, but in Greek, it's harpazo. And the Bible does use the word harpazo. 
for the bride being caught up to meet him in the air. Okay. And it tells us that the wise virgins are, he comes at midnight, right? It tells us in the full, in the parable of the virgins, he comes at midnight. Well, midnight is when everybody's asleep. He comes in secret, right? Um, and it tells us in first Corinthians 15, he says, behold, I show you a mystery. Okay. So it says we shall not all sleep. Right. But that word mystery is mysterion in Greek. And it means a secret. In fact, the scriptures version sells, I tell you a secret. Okay. Um, see, I see us. I speak a secret to you. Okay. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. So what, ha what I see is the wise virgins are caught up to meet him in the air on the feast of trumpets. And we go to heaven during the 10 days of all the there's 10 days between the feast of trumpets and the day of atonement. Right. And revelation two ten tells us that those from the, uh, congregation at Smyrna, they have to suffer, suffer tribulation for 10 days. Okay. That's, I believe those are the same 10 days between the feast of trumpets and the day of atonement. But those from Philadelphia who have not denied his name and they have kept his word, his commandments, they have the open door that no man can shut. So I believe they are taken up at the end of the three and a half years because the tribulation does not last for seven years. There's no such thing anywhere in scripture about a seven year tribulation. It is a made up theory by these theologians who misunderstand what Daniel 927 is talk about talking about. Daniel 927 is not talking about an antichrist leader who uh, presents a seven year peace treaty. It is not talking about that. Daniel 9 27 is talking about the real Messiah, Yahushua, who confirmed the Abrahamic covenant for one week. That's Passover week in the middle of the week, which he died on a Wednesday, middle of the week. He causes the sacrifice and the oblation to no longer be recognized by the father. Um, because why they're, they're, they crucified their own Messiah. So therefore, moving forward, every sacrifice they did on Yom Kippur um, every year, it tells us this in the Jewish Talmud, for 40 consecutive years after 30 AD, up until 70 AD when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem, every Yom Kippur sacrifice failed. The black stone came up every year. In fact, the mathematical odds of that happening for 40 consecutive years was like 5 billion to one. Okay. Um, Cause I, I researched this and that, that those are the mathematical odds. And every year the red ribbon failed to turn white when they sent the scapegoat into the wilderness. So for 40 consecutive years, the, the Jewish Talmud tells us this historical event happened for 40 consecutive years. The Yom Kippur sacrifice failed. And so this word cease means to cause to fail. So their Yom Kippur sacrifice ceased because they didn't accept him as the red heifer. And the red heifer is the, is what sanctifies the altar. My point in saying all this is that the, there's no such thing as a seven year tribulation. This is the tribulation is only three and a half years. So, um, Smyrna, I mean, excuse me, Philadelphia, I believe Philadelphia is describing the wise virgins. They have the oil in their lamps. What is the oil? Well, Song of Solomon 1.3 tells us what the oil is. It says in Song of Solomon 1.3, your name is like oil poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love you. So what is Philadelphia told? He said, they are told that you have not denied my name. So the name is super important. So those who've not denied his name go on the feast of trumpets. They're the wise virgins. 
But then what happens? The wise virgins tell the foolish virgins, go buy the oil. Well, I believe Smyrna represents the foolish virgins. They have good works. He commends them and says, you've got good works. He says, I know your works and your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, you know? And so he's telling them, you know, you've got good works, but something's missing. I believe these are the Jews in Jerusalem <clears throat> that are keeping the Torah, but they don't know his name yet. They, they're still waiting for the Messiah to come for the first time. And now the, the wise virgins are gone. They're going to realize they've missed him. During those 10 days between trumpets and atonement, they're going to go by the oil of his name. And then when he comes back, they're going to be ready to meet him at the Mount of Olives. They're going to be standing there waiting for him. And they're going to look upon the one whom they've pierced. So my point in saying this, if he's coming back on a white horse with his army, which is his bride, that means the rapture's already gone, done and gone. It's already happened. So can you cover quickly? Um, I was sorry, I'm still trying to keep up with the chat. Uh, very active, which is really cool. Um, so can you, did you just lay out the timeline for his return that he comes back on the Feast of Trumpets? The No, he, he comes for the bride on the Feast of Trumpets. Sorry, the bride, the, but, but the he, Rapturo, right? But, right. but then he comes back to earth on Yom Kippur 10 days later right, on, right. The, to the Mount of Olives. Right, and then there's atonement after that. Right. Right, and as SR said, he said the atonement is the bowl of wrath. Um, yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, and certainly the bride is coming back with perfected bodies that cannot be hurt, and we won't need to take classes in self-defense <laughs> or in Krav Maga. <laughs> I think we will have, have everything we need and be supernaturally uh, Endowed. Equi e equipped. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we will be doing work with our, our bridegroom. Right. But kicking. So, yeah, what you saw in your dream, Mark, that was the second coming, the rapture. By the time he's coming back to earth with his army, the rapture was 10 days pre prior to that. See what I mean? Yeah, totally. Totally. But yeah, the, I mean, but so. Does, I mean, it does. We we know that he's coming back. And I think, uh, you know, that's the, the, the point that a lot of these people are going to miss, you know, is mm -hmm. that they're not ready and that it's going to catch them off guard. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and a so, lot of us, you know, Joel two twenty eight, Maria told us that a lot of us, you know, he's going to give visions, signs, and dreams, right? And we're all going to see stuff. I mean, you've had a lot of dreams, plenty of them, and other of your listeners have had dreams, and um, it just it's going to start coming left and right because he's getting us ready. That's right, and. I had a just a quick point, Maria, and I know you've talked about this, and this isn't prophecy, you know, 20, 2028, uh, Yom Kippur 2028, you know, if that is the time that he comes back, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, I'm just speculating on that. I mean, right, right. I don't want to be understand. found a false prophet if he doesn't come no. back on Yom Kippur 2028, no. but I'm saying that but, everything's looking like that could be a viable date, you know? So... I think the sign, if that if that does happen, right, if that is going to happen, would you guys agree, Gary and Maria, if, if if we see the temple completed by next year, 2025, and the two witnesses start their ministry, they mm -hmm. would have to start their ministry next year. Right, for it to be three and a half years, yep. Right. Yep. So those are the two things we got, we're looking for next year mm -hmm. to take place. To, to really see if 2028 is the actual time. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. But I mean, we, we have a sign already that uh, Netanyahu said that it would start in November. That's right. Temple would be started in November. Now, the question is, guys, can they build it? You know, you would suppose that they'd want it built before uh, Passover 2025 to conduct sacrifices. That's right. But do you guys think they could build it? That would be five, six months. Yeah, they can do it in six months. I've read that, that they have the capability of doing it that fast. They have all the pieces. It's just like, 
It's like they have the box of Legos. All they got to do is assemble it, so to speak. They would just have, they would probably just have to have a large enough labor force, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. And keep them going long enough, you know. Right. Maybe six days a week minus the Shabbat and just keep them working, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. I have a friend from Louisiana. She's a prayer warrior. And her 15-year-old son had a dream like three, four years ago. And she told me about the dream. This was after Yahuwah already told me who Trump is, that he told me Trump is the rider on the white horse of Revelation 6-2. He told me that in March 21st, 2020. Well, this friend of mine, her son, she she sent me the YouTube video. She basically recorded him telling the dream on YouTube. And he's like, Mom, you know I don't have dreams about this stuff because I don't even think about this kind of stuff. But he was given a dream, and he said he saw Donald Trump getting out of this limousine in Jerusalem, and all these rabbis are, like, genuflecting, you know, like, bowing before him and and basically, you know, paying homage to him and stuff. And the temple was getting built. It was, like, in the process of being built. And he said before it even got finished, like, he said that he saw this big black furry creature that had big giant wings. He said it was humongous creature, um, which I believe is Apollyon because it talked about that in, you know, Revelation 9, 11. He saw this big giant creature come out of the sky and fell to the earth. And it like left like a huge crater in the earth. Like uh, when it fell to the earth, it left like a huge crater. And then he saw like another uh, creature just like it, only a smaller version of it. Like he said, uh, he saw a polyon, then he saw like a smaller one that was like a polyon junior, if you will. And and he said they were both big black furry creatures with wings that looked like, you know, like a devil, you know. And he said right after they were like genuflecting towards Trump and, he's, and the temples was being built that this happened. So that's interesting. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah. Uh, And I already knew that anyway, but then he had that dream and I was like, confirmation, (laughs) you know, so. So, hey, SR um, says that basically that the earth is going to be flattened um, at his second coming, except Jerusalem. So I asked him to provide a scripture just because I'm not familiar with what he's referring to, to, yeah. to, to say that. Um, he hasn't yet. I just want to make sure we're addressing properly what he's addressing, what mm-hmm. he's bringing up. Yeah. But I don't I don't know of that. I, I, in all my years of regular Christianity in a Pentecostal church or all my years of walking Torah and all the fellowships and reading the Bible as many times as I have, I don't recollect anything that says that when Messiah's second coming happens, that the earth will be flattened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't recall that. It just says the earth will melt with fervent heat. It says that. Which sounds really scary. Right. Um, But also, I believe that that before the flood, all the continents were connected as one supercontinent. Like, you know, and then after the flood... The um, earth was divided in the days of Peleg, right? So I believe in biblical Pangea, not that I believe that, you know, uh, the earth is really, uh, you know, billions of years old. I don't believe that. I believe in a young earth, you know. But I do believe that at one point, you know, here's a um, uh, here's a graphic I made where I... Sh- I was, this is what, when I was praying about the earth being flat was back in 2015, I said, Father, tell me if the earth is flat. And he goes, the earth is like a womb. That's what he said. He said, it's a womb. And so this is the picture I saw in my mind when I was praying. It showed me the baby in the womb. The earth is in the shape of a womb. He said, um, and so then I saw the baby in the womb. And then he showed me Pangea, okay? Now, I'd already been shown Pangea in 2002 after the events of 9-11. I was praying about what what was going on during 9-11. I'm like, what's this all about? And so for a whole year, I had like eight different dreams that year. 
And one of the dreams I had, I, I was awakened and I hear this audible voice. And there's only three times I've heard his voice audibly. But this was one of the times he says, Peleg, the earth was divided. So he showed me Pangea, that all the continents were connected before the flood. But was what, what kind of happened was like he had divided the continents of the earth. And I believe they're all going to come back together again during the millennium. That's just my theory, because I really think the earth, that all the continents are going to come back together again. And we're all, we're not going to have to travel that far to Jerusalem. Like, I mean, I don't know if there'll be airplanes or not. Those of us that are in our resurrected bodies will be able to just transport there like they do on Star Trek, right? But those of us that are not in those that are not in resurrected bodies that are in their natural bodies, they'll be able to travel on camel or horseback or whatever. I'm not really sure how that's going to happen, but I really think that the that the continents will be back together again. I don't think the earth is going to be flat per se. I still think it's going to be a spinning ball. The reason I say that is because it talks about how from one new moon to the next, all flesh shall come and worship me. So, um, you know, the moon is going to continue to function the way it does now. You know, um, flesh worship. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to continue the cosmos. Yeah, in Isaiah 66, 23, it shall come to, ba to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me. So I believe that the earth is going to, the earth and the cosmos and the planets and the celestial bodies are going to continue to function as they do now. But then what happens when the eighth millennium starts, there's not going to be any more seas. It says that there's no more seas. Um, and it says that, that in the um, new, the new Jerusalem it says there's no more sea. And it says and Revelation 21, 22, and I saw no temple therein, for Yahuwah Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And it says, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of Elohim did light it, lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So during the millennium, we're still going to be going to Jerusalem to worship from one new moon to the next. But now all of a sudden we're in the eighth millennium and there is no need of the moon. So this tells me that in, in Isaiah 66, when it says from one new moon to the next, we're going to continue to go to Jerusalem and worship the king. You know, that means that during the seventh millennium, all the celestial bodies are going to still be functioning the way they are now. But in the eighth millennium, I don't believe they're going to be functioning that way anymore. I, there's no more need of the sun. There's no more need of the moon. There's no more sea. So Well, and to, and to bolster the idea that everything will be, not everything, I don't mean everything, mm -hmm. that the natural order of the way the universe has been functioning will continue, although maybe with a little bit of resetting to what it was supposed to be in mm -hmm. terms of the year, um, because Egypt... Uh, doesn't get rain for three and a half years after the Messiah comes back and right. sets, that, sets up his kingdom on earth. The first three years of the millennium, they're, they're not celebrating uh, the feast like they're supposed to, the three pilgrimages. Not that every man, woman, and child has to go, but as a nation, they're, uh, they're refusing to take part, mm -hmm. right? So they're punished. So that's evidence that we still have free will, that's evidence that we still can obey and disobey and sin and not sin. You know, whoever's still alive and, and as people reproduce. And that's going to, you know, that is going to continue for those thousand years until, you know, the the creatures, the creature, the adversaries let out of the pit. And there's a final mm -hmm. um, rallying of, of mankind right. against Yahuwah mm -hmm. again. Right, and I don't know, like, if in the eighth millennium, the new heaven and the new earth, at that point in time, maybe the earth will be bigger, it'll become bigger, you know, to to accommodate how large the new Jerusalem will be. 
the new heaven, the new earth. Maybe at that point it'll be, be expanded. Maybe it'll be flattened out, like you say, but I, I don't think that's going to happen during the seventh millennium, you know. Right. Okay. So let's try to cover this. This I, I hope this doesn't take a long time. So, uh, SR, the last thing you said was, um, we're going to say this first and back up. So not that there is no sun or no moon, but in Jerusalem, it isn't needed because the Messiah and, and Yahuwah. I would agree that, um, again, in the New Jerusalem, that's not needed. So if that's what you're talking about, I'm in agreement with the New Jerusalem, not needing a sun and the moon. Right, in the eighth millennium. The eighth millennium. But during the seventh millennium, it's going to be the same right. model as we have now, only right. renewed. Because we're not going to have the sun go away and the moon go away only for that city, but for the rest of the world, there is still a sun and the moon, it's going to exist. So I think that's, I think you would probably agree with that. So, um, but uh, SR and Perry threw out, can you jot these down? Honey, can you, can you jot these down? Okay. I got to find something to write with. Yep. Where is So the... this is just so that we cover things uh, briefly. Need something to write yeah, with. Right in the back of this. Okay. So Isaiah four forty. Okay. Um. And then Psalm ninety one. That's from Perry. Different, not our Perry, but different Perry. Okay. And then um, Luke three five. Mm hmm. Luke 3, 5 is talking about every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, mm -hmm. and every crooked and shall be made straight. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the three scriptures. So let's start with the Isaiah. When do we start the next teaching? I paused it again. So after after we answer this, then we'll go ahead and go. Okay, Isaiah 440. Here we yeah. go. Uh, Isaiah 440. Um, I don't see it. I don't see it. I only see... Isaiah 4 goes up to verse 6. Did I look at that wrong? Sorry, Isaiah 44. You know, I have dyslexia, you know, you just change the dots and, you know. Okay, what verse are we looking at? 4, 40. Four. Okay. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. First, he's talking about Jacob, my servant. Uh, it says, Yahuwah has made you and formed you from the womb, which will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you... Uh, Yeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon you that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit upon your seed, and my blessing upon your offspring, and they shall spring up among... No, no sorry. Forty-four. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, sorry, guys. <laughs> comfort you, comfort you, my people, saith your Elohim. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of Yahuwah's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare you the way of Yahuwah, make straight in the desert a highway for our Elohim. Uh, uh, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and... The glory of Yahuwah shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Yahuwah has spoken it. So, um, so you're saying that the, you think that this means that the earth will be flattened? I don't think that's what it's saying personally. I think it's just that it's just saying that um, the lowly will be brought high, and the high will be brought low. Yeah, like kind of like uh, the proud will be shamed, and those who are, uh, uh, you know, sort of crushed spirits will be will be elevated and yeah he's going to make it make the make things more accessible so that people can get to jerusalem for the feasts i believe um and that word plain it's big uh it means a split which reminds me of what happened in the days of peleg after the flood that i believe it's possible that the continents are all going to come back together again tells us in Zechariah that the mountains shall the mountains shall be divided when he comes back the mountains shall split in half you know so yeah I mean 
It doesn't mean that the Earth will go from being a sphere to being a flat disk hanging in space. Right. Okay. So let's let's not form our opinions quite yet. So let's take what it says there, and I just want to go chronologically um, since. Uh, Perry offered Psalms 91. Okay, let's go to Psalm 91. Uh, let's see. Are you talking about Psalm 19, Perry? Because Psalm 19 is what it talks about in the... Uh, they said Psalm 91. Okay, so let me they, go to Psalms 91. Um, ooh, 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 Psalms 91. What, what verse involves Psalms 91? They don't say. Okay. All right. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save Yahuwah. He is my refuge and my fortress, my Elohim, and him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid. Oh. So, so, Sorry, they were saying that they were referencing that scripture for you who uh, um, taking them through their surgery they were hit by a drunk driver so um oh who so was hit by perry perry holman oh so, is it um okay so just for brevity's sake we'll, we will uh skip this and go to luke 3 5. okay luke 3 5. okay thanks for that correction perry every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways shall be made smooth. Yeah. But that like that doesn't mean that the earth will stop being a sphere and become like a flat disk that just hangs in no, he didn't say that. He didn't say a flat disk per se, just meaning that the the surface would be sort of, you know Yeah. I mean I can see that because I think it's gonna be like he's gonna melt the earth with fervent heat, right? So if he melts the earth with fervent heat that means I think all the, I personally believe all the continents are going to come back together again, like before the flood, pre Pangea. And it's going to be people have easy access to Jerusalem, like they'll be able to travel to go to the to make pilgrimage to the feasts and stuff like that. Um, but does that mean I mean, I don't know if, if this person's making a case for um, flat earth or what? No, no, they're not. Oh, okay. They're not. They're just talking about what happens when Messiah returns. That there'll be a great earthquake and the, sure, the, sure. the heat and everything would melt. I think of like if you have a bowl of ice cream, you mm -hmm. have the high spots, as it's called, clumped in there. The high spots are high. The low spots, there's valleys between this, the mm -hmm. round balls. And then as it melts, the the you know it, the high spots go down and the low spots sort of rise up with the liquid. And mm -hmm. anyway, right. Um, so so it, go to Luke three five to finish up the references. I thought I did finish it, but okay, Luke. Three five, three five. Okay. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made. Oh, that's what you just went to. I'm sorry. Great, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. So there's places where it talks about everything crooked, like meaning crooked people and uh, crooked. Um, let me see. I'm trying to find those passages. It, this is like Yom Kippur language, right? Um, um, that which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting shall not. That's not what I wanted. Let's see. In that day, Yahuwah with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Um, yeah, every valley shall be exalted every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough place places plain um isaiah 42 16 i will bring the blind by the way that they know not i will lead them in paths that are they have not known i will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight these things will i do unto them and not forsake them um, and then Isaiah 45, 2, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. Uh, Isaiah 59, 8, the way of peace they have not known, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Who, whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. Um, 
He has enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. So I believe that, yes, this could be literally speaking like that the earth shall be made smooth. But also, I believe this is talking about everything that's wrong with the world. You know, the state that, you know, we're in this fallen world because of what happened in the garden, the rebellion, that all of that crookedness uh, will be made straight again. Like, you know, everything that's wrong with the cosmos as a result of the curse of sin, the crookedness of the world in general, people, the, you know, the way everything's created, all of that crookedness is going to be made straight. So, I'm looking at this as beyond just a literal interpretation, not to say it won't be also the earth being made smooth, but this goes beyond that. I think it's talking right. about everything right. that's wrong with the world. Right. Okay. So we're not going to go here just from time, um, but then the last thing he mentioned, and thank you for that. Uh -huh. SR, and we should go there. Um, he said, he mentioned Michael Heiser's Hebrew cosmology. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a, familiar with that um but you can jot that down michael heiser yeah I, i'm familiar okay. yeah okay so i've written 14 blogs like basically debunking the whole flat earth with my yeah he's not but he's not talking about okay that. all right I, I mean unequivocally that's not what he's saying all right um <clears throat> you know we're just trying to you know rightly divine the word um so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read this, you can respond, and then we'll go to the next blog. So, Oh, somebody asked about the one-year tribulation. Yeah, I was going to say, so Michael first said, um, so the actual um, script layout for the misinterpreted Daniel 9 that supports a three-and-a-half-year tribulation versus, or instead of the, the year, the seven-year, um, that is. He said, it's Messiah that confirms the covenant, not the Antichrist. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Or the little horn. Um and then the Messiah stops the sacrifices that, in terms of the abomination that causes desolation, right? Well, it's not that he stopped. They continue to perform the sacrifices. He stops, to rec he stops recognizing them. Yeah. They, when he died on the cross, they continued to perform the sacrifices. But the Jewish Talmud records that for 40 consecutive years from 30 A.D. until 70 A.D. 30 A.D. is when he died. 70 A.D. was the Roman siege. For those 40 consecutive years, the Jewish Talmud says that all these anomalies were happening where the temple doors kept flying open by themselves. Mm -hmm. the, old, the brazen altar, the fire kept going out on the brazen altar all by itself. They knew that judgment was coming. But they probably didn't put two and two together that it was that they crucified their own Messiah. I bet some did. Some probably did. Yeah. <laughs> um, I bet you Nick and Emus was like, yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And Joseph of Arimathea, <laughs> you know, and all the apostles. Um, I wonder how many were like, I told you, you know. Yeah, exactly. But uh, anyway, what was the, I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, so Michael wanted to, you know, is just referencing, you know, pointing to, I guess, how it is that in the timeline, um, how does it you get three and a half years versus seven and verifying that it's the Messiah who stops the sacrifices or, or stops honoring them. And then Valerie went to say later on that someone teaches there's only going to be a one year tribulation. I know. On that? I know I who that's that... Michael Rude. No, Isn't that Michael Rude. Well, ministry? yeah, him. No, it's. Um, that guy that you, Steve Matria from 119. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he teaches. Michael Root is the one and a half year ministry. You know, you know, he teaches that Messiah's ministry only lasted for for one year. It was one, okay, so yeah. I'm, I'm confusing that. But yeah, you're right, Matria. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, he does a video on that. And um, in this blog, Valerie, the one called um, Except Those Days Should Be Shortened. Let me see which one it is. I'm trying to find it. Yeah. In this blog, I explain. The word shortened, okay? Because after we watched Steve Mutria's video, I was like, what? The tribulation clearly says three and a half years. And he's like speculating that maybe the tribulation is shortened to one year. So I decided to look up the word shortened, shortened, and come to find out 
It's this Greek word kolobo, which means to dock, to abridge, or to shorten. So when I looked that up, kolazo, the, the, Greek, the Greek word, the root word kolazo means to curtail, to chastise, to punish, right? But when I saw the word dock, I immediately, I looked it up in the dictionary. It says a landing pier, the space or waterway between two piers or wharves as for receiving a ship while in port. So this is an uh, this is a picture of what that might look like, right? A landing pier. So you have this something that separates the the body of water, okay? But then when I saw that, I immediately remembered that in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel asks, how long shall these things be? And he's told that he sees a man standing in the middle of the river, holding up his right hand and his left hand. Now, what does the right hand and the left hand represent? Represents both houses of Israel because Ezekiel was told to lay on his right side for the sins of Judah and on his left side for the sins of Israel. So this man, I believe, is Messiah. I believe he's standing in the middle of this body of water. And on one side and on the other side are two different messengers, right? And this is what he says. He says, But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two other, other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. So he's describing the time of the tribulation as two men, each of them on different sides of the banks of the river. So our Messiah is the one who stood in the gap. Why do you think he he was crucified between two thieves? Because in Ezekiel 22.30, Ezekiel asks a rhetorical question. Is there a man who can stand in the gap? And then it talks about this, about repairing the breach. Well, what's a breach? A breach means something that's been divided. Well, the two kingdoms were divided after Solomon died. So... Who's the one that stood in the gap and repaired the breach? It was Messiah, right? He dies in the middle of two thieves. He dies in the middle of two evenings, between the two evenings. He also dies in the middle of the seven years. So he dies after three and a half years. Okay. So by by dying in the middle of the he dies in the middle of the seven days in the middle of the seven years and in the middle of the seven thousand years so he dies in the middle of the week within the week within the week why he had to stand in the gap to repair the breach the breach is a divided kingdom right michael did you want to clarify how i bungled your question <laughs> i see your mic's open so I didn't know if you were. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was so well said before. I just wanted to write it down because I'm not able to record about like, okay, so it's Messiah who confirms the covenant. Mm-hmm. And then the sacrifices are stopped. It's vague, the timeline thing, like, because uh, how does it exactly get to the place where uh, the abomination is erected in the holy place? Okay. Uh, just be short, the bullet points, you know. All right, I'll try. I'll try to condense this. Yeah, you you really, sh- you really should go to my teaching on who confirms the covenant of Daniel's seventieth week because it, it it's it really I can't do it any justice in a short period of but, time. But do it in a short period. I'll try, I'll try. I'll try. I'll try. Because we're at four hours. Okay. And we still have to do I know. I know. Okay. He shall confirm. That word confirm, gabar, means to strengthen. The covenant. What covenant? You look up the word covenant. It means to walk between pieces of flesh. Well, we know that's okay. talking about Abraham's covenant, right? So who confirmed the Abrahamic covenant? And what did he do the night before he dies? He held up the cup and said, this is the blood of my covenant shed for many. That's the key okay. word, many. The night before he dies, he lifts up the cup and said, this is the blood of my covenant shed for many. Passover is one week. Okay. 
Seven days. Not only is this talking about seven days, this word week, Shabua, can mean seven days. It can mean seven years. It can even mean 7,000 years. The word means anything that's divisible by seven. So he dies in the middle of the seven-day Passover week, which was a Wednesday, what we would today call Wednesday, the fourth day of the week. He dies in the middle of the seven years. Why did he die in the middle of the seven years? I always wondered about how come Jacob worked seven years for Rachel and Leah each for a total of 14 years. How come Joseph worked in Egypt two periods of seven years back to back? Now Messiah only works half of a week. Well, because by the time Messiah comes onto the scene, the kingdom's divided. Mm -hmm. So now what's he do? He's like, okay, the kingdom's divided. I have to stand in the gap. I have to... I have to repair the breach and bring these two kingdoms back together. So he dies in the middle of the week on purpose to show he's the one that stands in the gap. He's the only one that can repair the divided kingdom. So he stands in the gap. Okay. So seven divided by two is three and a half. This is proof. He died. He had a three and a half year ministry. In fact, Luke chapter four tells us that right after he went into the synagogue and read the Isaiah 61 scroll, and he's, yeah, he, he actually did, compared his ministry to Elijah the prophet. He says, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country, but I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. There you go. He just said three and a half years when great famine was throughout all the land. So what happened? Israel became a widow. In Isaiah 54, Israel, the country, is called a widow because she crucified her own Messiah. But this widow that Elijah raised up the, her son after three and a half years of ministry, this woman's son dies. Who do you think that's a prophetic picture of? The widow's son, firstborn only son, dies after Elijah's three and a half years are finished. And then what? Elijah prays for the boy how many times? Three times. Hmm, could it be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? Hmm, you see the connection there? He's telling them... My ministry is going to be like Elijah, three and a half years, and you're the widow. And at the end of three and a half years, your firstborn son, me, I'm going to die. And I'm going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, just like when Elijah prayed for this boy three times and the boy's resurrected. He's giving them a hint. His ministry was three and a half years. Okay. <laughs> so the other three and a half years is when the two witnesses come onto the scene, they pick up where he left off. They pick up where he left off and they finish the week. So that's why we know, Valerie, that this guy who says that the tribulation's only one year, it doesn't fit. Because we are told in Daniel chapter 12 that it shall be for a time, times and a half times. Okay, so Daniel 12 tells us time, times, and a half a times right here. He says, um, but you, Dan, wait, let me see. That's not what I wanted. Uh, yeah, he says, uh, uh, uh. how long, what shall be the end of these things? Okay. And then he, he, uh, let's see, Oh, yeah, here it is. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand. What do you think the right hand and the left hand means? Didn't Messiah die between the two thieves on the right hand and on the left hand? The two thieves represent the two houses of Israel. You know, he held up his right hand and his left hand that representing two halves, two halves. Right. And he swore by him that lives forever that it shall be for a time. That word time is moed, which means a year, one year, a cycle of seven festivals. Times would be plural, two years and a half, six months. Time times and a half is three and a half years. He says it shall be for a time times and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Yeah, the whole 
idea of a one year tribulation is doesn't fit. Okay. So he shortened the week. It was supposed to be a full seven years. He shortened it on purpose by dying in the middle of the week. Okay. So then you you are going to continue with the, with the bullet points of the steps of the you know tribulation, the the temple, the abomination. What am I doing? I'm I'm confused. Uh huh. Okay, so he should. Uh, what am I? What am I ask? What am I doing? I don't know. I need to use the little kid's room. Sorry, Michael. She she got into it and and uh, sorry. That's perfectly okay. It's yeah. awesome. And yeah. I'll I'll read the blogs. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Sure. Um. So you guys, if you want to prepare for the next one, um, I'm just gonna sort of. Uh, keep the mic silent here. Marie is going to use the restroom. And um, if you click over to the tab on our YouTube page that says live stream, you'll see there's another one that's we're late for, or maybe we're late for. Anyway, I'll start that in, here in a few minutes. So let's say we'll start it at 4.15 my time, which is in six minutes. And uh, if you're on Zoom, then we'll stay. But the other ones, you guys will be will be dumped soon. So let me get that ready. In fact, as soon as I start seeing her moving the mouse and it catches up, then I will kill that stream. In fact, I will share this new one. Yep, save. Okay, guys. Here's the here's the link to the next stream. At minutes. Okay. All right, so I'm going to end that stream. Uh, I stop the recording. Please stop recording. Stop recording. Eject cassette. Okay. Stop.